Sí. I, I have to ask you. Sí, no, no, no. Tommy, I have to ask you about your... No, 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 we're just uh, getting into it. I have to ask you about your setup because um, yep. I am absolutely worthless without Danny. You know, I, I have no <laughs> idea how I could set everything up um, if Danny wasn't here. Um, thank you, Danny, by the way. Thank you. Uh, so let's see if... Hello, Danny. Are... Well. Hello, Danny. Oh, yeah. So Tommy's saying uh, hello, Danny. Um, yeah, yeah, because... Uh, because I, I'm guessing that because we, we have to um, use a tripod, I don't know if yours is just coming from the ceiling, like your setup is just from above. I can't, yes, so yeah. go ahead. I, I used to have um, this boom tripod, yeah, um, which was about, I don't know, the, the like legs part of it went to about 72 inches, okay. I think. And then it had a two meter boom sort of stand on it um, that was weighted at one end so yeah. it could take the weight of the camera being sort of extended so far. Yeah. Um, and that got it uh, high enough in the air that I could sort of essentially get it to look over my head. Right, right. Um, and then I just tilted my my surface back a little bit. Um, but eventually sort of I got to... Like, I, it was just the tripod took up way, way too much room. I paint in quite a small space. Right. Um, and everything right. is always about, like, okay, how can I do this? But how can I make this take as little space um, as possible so I can get sort of as much going? Um, and then, yeah, I just sort of eventually... Uh, I'd been aware from of these uh, really heavy-duty clamps yeah. that Manfrotto yeah. do uh, because when way way back uh, i think in like 2015 or something um when david kassan released the parallel palette thing right, right. that he um released uh you had to use one of these clamps essentially because it can take like 15 kilos of weight oh no way um so it could take the weight of the palette and i was like oh that's gotta be sort of more than the camera yeah um and yes the camera just is attached to a like a big rod type thing that we ended up putting into the ceiling oh see, um, that's just the into the struts oh that's that's the good stuff see our yeah. ceiling is like a like a little fake uh ceiling i mean it's i guess it's good to have like uh um like these spaces for your ceiling so you can do all the electrical work but the ceiling itself yep. is just uh drywall maybe so we yep. can't really drill anything I mean, this is when we rent, by the way. So we can't, yeah. we wouldn't be able to drill anything that could be, you know, that, that where I could feel comfortable, like, yeah, I'm going to suspend my camera, you know, from this. I could rig yeah. something up, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I wouldn't trust that it could hold really well. But um, yeah, yeah, I always wanted to ask you because um, setting like the setup for us and, and, and for everyone that's listening, you know, if you've ever tried to record painting, it is it is just hell. It's absolute hell. Yeah. And it's hell yeah. even before you start to paint. Like after you paint, if it yeah. starts to glare like crazy, it's just even worse. So um so anyways, we should uh we should say hi. So I'm sorry that Danny's not gonna be with us today because we are running like crazy because we're leaving um well, pretty much after tomorrow, because we're leaving like early morning, uh, really early morning, like Thursday. Um, and we're yeah. hoping to do to to uh, start shipping our book, I guess, you know, best case scenario um, Friday, which I don't think so. Uh, but best okay. case scenario, maybe Saturday we can start. No, Fantastic. no, maybe not. No, maybe I'm just willing it, I'm, but not not really. Uh, probably Monday. So. Um, if we are, if we are, um, packing books on Saturday, I'm going to feel great. Uh, we're going to have to probably ship around 50 books each day, which is pretty good. I think we could do, um, could pump out those numbers. Um, so we have to have like so much like dumb little logistics set up so that, you know, the time that we're there, we're going to use it like super, super effectively so that, um, yeah, we can get everything done. 
And I am 100% sure that none of it is going to go as we planned. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and everything's going to be just like like obstacles all over the way. And we're going to have to um, work things out as we go. But but yeah, because we're we're leaving on on um, on Thursday early morning. Yeah, we're running around like crazy. So um, so hello to everyone. But so yeah, so Danny's like having you know she's setting up like tons of things that we've um, still yet to uh, to have figured out for the uh, for the trip. Uh, I'm gonna sort of solo this one because um, but not really on on. You know, the obvious end, because I'm going to paint with Tommy. And for people that don't know Tommy, Tommy's a great painter. I'm pretty sure that most people, uh, we, we're probably like in the Sven diagram. We're, we're probably really connected that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, most people that follow me follow you too. So that's, that's awesome. Um, if you haven't followed, uh, uh, if you don't follow Tommy's account, like Tommy, you can share your, um, all your social stuff. And we'll, yeah. we'll in the description, we'll leave um, a link for, uh, for your, um, your Instagram stuff, um, or your TikTok stuff. I don't, I don't know where you're, uh, where you're putting your, uh, your energy now, or your, um, you know, portrait artist of the year. Because I'm guessing you're gonna <laughs> next year. You're also gonna be uh, coming back, so uh, for for a third appearance. Um, yeah, but I'm gonna paint with Tommy, obviously, and uh, and no, and props to Danny also because I can't do this. Like I honestly can't do this. Um, if it wasn't for her. So Tommy, I know you, you wanted us to paint, um, like movie stills, like color studies, yeah. like, col yeah, but, uh, sorry, I'm going to still, <laughs> I'm going to still make it, uh, revolve around color, uh, for today. But, uh, yeah, no, nah, I've been running around like so crazy that I was like, uh, I don't know. And, and I thought, let me just, uh, you know, do something from something that I've, uh, seen recently. I thought of uh, green Knight. But, and, and then I was okay. scrubbing like crazy, but then I was like, oh, I don't know. But then um, the other morning I woke up, I wake up like super early so I can get my, um, my kids uh, to, uh, to school, like breakfast and, and, and ready for school. And it was, it was still like, you know, like probably like five in the morning. I just uh, turned on a light. I saw some grapes in a bag and I was like, that's what we're painting, grapes in a bag. So I took some photos and that's what I'm going to try to do today. So this is like 5 a.m., uh, kitchen top grapes in a bag artificial light yeah that's where that's that's, where, that's what i'm gonna do so sounds yeah. amazing uh um, i don't know it sounds good like we i still gotta paint it so what are you gonna no, do yeah that is, what are you gonna that do? is always that is always the the trick it's yes. like yep this idea it sounds amazing um execution but when you actually come to it it's it's not always not always the one um but i i mean i can't i can't uh sort of empathize enough <laughs> with the sort of one of wanting to get everything shipped out and sort of hoping for the best oh Jesus. but it just you know it it's always the case that it's like oh okay yep this is longer than it took or like longer than i anticipated oh uh, everything um, is that the world is there just to fall apart so it's perfect. yeah I'm, I'm, it's perfectly I'm fine always sort of overestimating it's like oh no it's fine i can do this in this time it'll be fine um and then sort of you actually look at the task and it's like oh, okay this is um this is gonna take a while uh for sure but it it is what it is yeah so, yeah that's the nature of things so what are you painting today uh tommy what are you gonna do so i'm i'm painting uh, a still from a movie called in the mood for love um haven't, which is haven't watched that movie if i have to be honest i've only uh, it came out in like 2000 or something okay. and I only um, heard about it because uh, do you know Ojo like Athena this artist on Instagram yeah, yeah. Um, she she rec like recommended the movie to me okay um, I was like sort of like looking for some particularly like interestingly lit movies yeah um, and she suggested it to me and then immediately just like fell in love um with the whole movie it's just shot like nothing i've ever really watched before um and i sort of couldn't recommend the uh watching enough um uh, and i'm going to give no spoilers okay at all um because i do i would highly re recommend the watch so um but yeah it's a scene from that it's probably the like third or fourth painting that i've 
worked on from that movie that I've just sort of been oh, trying dang, to. Nice. Well, it, it became a thing earlier in the uh, sort of year mm-hmm. that um, Tammy and Nicole from the Kenya groups uh, set up this like film challenge mm. where we all watched movies. We'd talk about the movie and then sort of um, just do some paintings and have all this work from it. Right. And um, right. it was really interesting because generally I'm I'm like so terrible at watching movies. I you just I can't sit still for long enough. Um, I'm sort of always pausing it. I'm always like sort of st- stop starting texting people about what they thought about different scenes. I'm like the worst. Oh person my god! Remind me to never um, watch a movie with you. Never. Well, ever. The thing is, I I just I don't find it like at all uh restful like i don't think it's something my mind switches off during it's just always oh you're always uh, like thinking yeah it's just sort of like trying to visually examine the the sort of like stuff yeah um which it's just not a very relaxing experience but yeah um it uh leads to some sort of like interesting uh like thoughts or sort of like highlights about movies and stuff but um yeah i sort of uh, well, i kind watch... of i can say i kind of understand that in a in a in, in a way more superficial manner which is that i usually don't cry i don't emote through movies i really don't i mean uh, I get excited when Captain Amer- Captain America holds like Mjolnir or something like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm like one of those people that screams in the theater. But you know, stuff that you, you know people are sobbing right next to me. I always think either of the voice actors. So let's say like if you're watching Toy Story and all the toys are gonna get burnt in these like trash compactor thing. Yeah. And everyone's yeah. like, oh my god! Everyone's crying. I'm always thinking of like the voice actors, like having to do the voices and modulate the voices for the uh, for the characters. So I'm always thinking of like the person that's behind. And in yeah. any other scene, in like in like you know movies, I guess like real life movies, I um I always picture the actors. So if somebody's yeah. having like you know the, the the one that gets me the most most of the time is like um you know, birth scenes, like, you know, the, the, all these women like screaming and grabbing all the sheets and sweating, just like veins popping out, like on their um, necks. Um, and I'm always picturing that's an actress. That's uh, yeah. Yeah. There's uh, that's, that's an actress. And I don't know why my brain is always in those moments. I guess that, you know, they, they ask of you to be like super emotionally connected. I get, I think my defense mechanism is always just to be like, Oh yeah, that's an actress. It's like that's an actress. Yeah. That's an actor. Yeah. So so I always kind of like zone out. Um, but yeah, but but I I can, um, I can shut off like the artist brain, the critical artist brain, when I'm watching movies. I I think that it it would be impossible, uh, for me to to be super on like while watching Marvel movies. So. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think you kind of have to say, OK, compromise here. I'm just going to shut this off and and just, you know, blindly enjoy this, this, um, you know, it's like a popcorn little flick and just. You know. Yeah, I feel it's it's funny as well, because I feel like I've got quite a, a high tolerance for like the suspension of disbelief of like a lot of things that are happening, or whatever, if like the story doesn't fully add up or whatever. I'm like, oh, it's okay. Whatever. That's like trying. It's like more important that the story is being told like well, rather than it being sort of like super accurate or anything. Um, but yeah, it's just. Uh, I think it's just with sort of visual information, like because I mostly listen to music. Like that's the thing that I sort of unwind to and stuff really. So it's. Mm-hmm. But um, I know that like other people have that sort of same engagement with listening to music where it's like they listen to music very actively Mm -hmm. um, and it's not really a a place for them to like rest to it's um yeah yeah it's sort of curious as to that's one of the reasons i i I don't um i don't particularly listen to stuff anymore while i'm painting i i I don't because i i don't know i mean maybe it's like my I don't know the way I was not brought up with music, but the way I kind of understood or like interiorized listening to music 
when I was a kid, it was just like, um, you know, you either had like a boom box, like some sort of like old ass boom box or yeah. just a, you know, crappy Walkman. And I either had, you know, I would put on a radio station and just, you know, lie in bed, like everything dark and you're just listening to music, like actually listening or, yeah. um, you know, or you start, you listen to stuff that you recorded off the radio or stuff. Like, I mean, I, I was, th that's kind of how I understood music. And, um, so it was, it was almost like, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to listen to music, but I wasn't, I don't know. I, 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 I think it was only until like painting in school that I was like, okay, I guess, you know, when people paint, they put music on because just because, you yeah. know, my teacher would just bring, well, we had a boom box. I think we were listening to like a classical radio station in New York. Um, but then they would put that on and we would listen to that because it was like, yeah, that's the only thing we can all agree on. If there's 35 yes. people, yeah, 35 people in there, like you're never going to have make everyone agree on, on, you know, what, what you put on. So, um, so it was, you know, th th that was it. And I remember when I came back after school, like I c sort of carried that tradition and I would listen to the radio, like the classical radio station. There were like two radio stations, um, you know, a long time ago. Uh, I would put those on or I would, um, or I would, I started buying stuff. I started buying like tons of CDs and, um, and then I would put those on and that was, it was weird. Cause that was like the stretch that I was working like by myself. I actually rented out a, an, an apartment that I would use for a studio. Um, but then after that, I think it kind of slowly, slowly became more silent. I don't know why. I think it's cause I, I had to, um, I had to transition from, you know, I, I think, after my son was born, I was like, okay, this is too, like, this is too expensive just to have this studio, like just to pay for this uh, studio. Um, and I, and I said, no, I, I could work from, you know, from home. And I, you know, there was an extra room and I had, I would set up in that extra room. And, um, but you know, you, you can't just have music like, um, playing. I can't use like headphones because if you know the baby's crying or something i have to go and, and and see what the baby needs so i remember kind of the music slowly fading because i just needed to be super alert about everything and um and it just you know it was i i think at that moment it became like it faded it faded and then it was kind of gone and i didn't even notice and after a while i was like okay yeah and you know, I, I started to paint just because life kind of life has taken me from me having like an independent space or me having like a place that I lived and paint and then that it was big enough to like hold both then to having a small room to paint, then to having a small room, but somewhere else to paint, then to having like a proper like apartment that I set up so that I can have like a, you know, big studio to paint then to having a small room to paint, then to having like a bigger place to paint that wasn't quite mine, to then going back to my parents' house to paint in my old room, to then, right. <laughs> yeah, it's always been like, um, like, uh, I don't know. I, I, I always felt that um, spaces were not important. Like spaces would come and go and um, it didn't really matter like how small or how large the space was um you know of course if you can't you, you wouldn't want to paint something that doesn't quite fit in that space but um yeah but yeah. when i had the largest wall the space with the largest wall i said oh i'm gonna do like large paintings i'm gonna do these these very large paintings just because i can now but i never thought it was like um oh that's that's like real painting. I wish I could go back to like real, like big wall painting. Um, I just always felt, okay, that's now we are off to a new, new space and you know, it's going to not dictate what I have to paint, but I have to be okay with not fighting this space or not um, making excuses for the space. 
Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. Or not just yearning for a bigger space while I was there because it didn't quite make sense to like do that. So I don't know. I don't know. And and that it's, that took me here, you know, and that was the beginning of our conversation to this space, which I'm going to have to. Well, I don't have to, but I, I kind of, you know, my, my kids, when they stay with with us, they share like a room and they're getting yeah. older and I'm like, uh, that's, you know, I always, we were like five kids. So I always shared rooms with, um, I shared rooms with my brother and then I shared rooms with my sister. And then I eventually was, you know, with myself. But for example, I had three sisters, but they all shared, like they had like this long room in, in my old house that they shared, you know, throughout their lives. So, um, yeah. but you know, I, I, I've always been like, oh, I, I do want my kids to have like independence. So I wish I could have like a room for Danny and me, a room to paint, a room to, for Danny to work and, you know, a room yeah. for Fed and a room for Samu. But no, we, we can't afford, you know, we can't even come close to affording any of that. So, you know, I'm going to give uh, Fed this room, I think next year. That's what um, I told her. And uh, next year, my setup setup is gonna be even more like uh, punkish. I feel it's even, it's gonna be a lot more. Um, I don't know, available space, whatever it is, available light, whatever it is, yeah. and we're gonna make it work. Cause I I feel bad. Like, well, I, it's, go ahead. It's just so interesting though to have that sort of mentality of it doesn't really matter about the space. And I like I was on Insta the other day in like Lou, um, Lou Beltran. Yep. Oh, just yeah. This, um, like photo of her, like using some like a four portfolio sleeve type thing mm -hmm. as a palette mm -hmm. and a painting popped up on like, I don't know. It was like a lamp or something just painting in like a hotel room or something. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that really is just like, it's very punk. It's just like, yep. It doesn't matter what the setup is. It's just sort of yeah. It helps doing that it. it helps um, that she's one of the most talented painters that I've ever known. So you know she's amazing. As well. She yeah. she has to be. I mean, I've I've talked I've talked about this, but I had as a student. I'm gonna say that both of them. I'm gonna say I've had them. I had them as students, but they were not my students. Like you know, everything I could I could teach them, you know. It, it was probably like 15 minutes of their time and they got it and then they ran with it. And then it's like, yeah, it's over. Like, it, it, you know, they, they did their, they understood it. They went and did their own thing. But uh, Luisa, Luisita and Grace, Gracina. Yeah. 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 Those are two of the most talented people I've ever met. Like crazy, crazy talented. Like Grace is just out of this world discipline. Like, it's it's insane how good like a drafts person she is like it's it's yeah. crazy how good she is and Luisita is she's just she devours like you know she sees how to do something like one time and she's like okay I got it you know I I understand yeah. and that's just insane like that's crazy that 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 I had I mean I I certainly never saw that when I was in school because all of us seem to struggle like like you know it was so crazy hard for us that i never experienced somebody just picking something up and be like okay that's fine and um yeah and she she's yeah she's remarkable she's absolutely remarkable so she's doing like um she's she she is in a like a very separate path now just you know i feel she she she's like she wanted to be like ground level and like start from literally like knowing nothing. Uh, and then she's building up from that, doing like her um, her clay work, her ceramic work, yeah, which is really cool because she, she has this kind of wide-eyed, um, you know, perspective on life that she wants to be blown away by the simplest of things. So, yeah, you know, so what better way to do that than to just go back to like super... Uh, fundamental basics about any art practice and and then just start from there and then you know slowly build up from there but um but she's amazing i, I really have a, a feeling that um 
she is one of those people that whatever she wants to do in life, like she's going to excel at it because yeah. she's just that good. Like she is remarkable, like, you know, very, very different from, from what I saw when I was in school for sure. It's, it's definitely different as well. Cause I don't know if it's just sort of from being able to look sort of backwards at sort of people who are 20 now, um, because I've, I've, I'm 29, so I'm sort of Getting like old, Tommy. I, well, I, I know. Jesus I'm still, Christ! So, well, um, I had some like. There goes to, there goes our young young audience. Like no, um, like um, I've sort of I'm looking back at the sort of because I was I was 20 mm-hmm. um, when I joined Instagram. Yeah, and I've had the same account for 10 years at this point. That's um, crazy. And I definitely have noticed like a real difference in sort of Instagram. Yeah. Um, but I definitely see people who are like 19, 20, um, and are just absolutely blowing um, everybody around them out the water. Uh, and it's just like, oh, yeah, you're going to be uh, fantastic. Like at whatever you do, you're just so talented that you're, you sort of are going to do great great paintings that or whatever artwork you sort of end up making yeah um you're just gonna be fantastic at it um and that's definitely really exciting um but it's also like it's quite it, yeah it's quite an interesting sort of space to to be an artist on in instagram i feel sort of like especially as as people who have potentially been on the app a bit longer yeah um sort of it's it's interesting to sort of see all the changes that it's had and all the way that people have sort of responded to those uh, changes and um it's sort of nothing new but it's it's definitely interesting to sort of see how we can navigate that space as artists because i think it's i think it's fantastic as a space for artists um if you sort of don't expect too much <laughs> from it if that makes sense if yeah. you just sort of allow it to be what it is um and sort of you don't expect it to be this like massive sales uh platform where you're like selling work all the time but just sort of use it as a space that you can communicate with other artists and i think it's there's no other space like that um so yeah it's definitely interesting i have of- i i'm of a like a torn mind between and i think that's it's probably exacerbated by the um you know, the, the new Twitter, like the new, you know, Musk uh, version of Twitter that I think deep down, there's a lot of people that are like, okay, this, hopefully this is the beginning of the end. Like, hopefully this just burns to the ground. Like this is, you know, or maybe Musk just breaks it, just really breaks it, just makes it so impossible. And so, um, almost like capricious that you know whatever he's going to do with that 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 it's just it breaks people it people go like you know what i think we're better off without this like we're we're, we're going to wait for the next thing whatever it may be but we maybe we're better off without this and um yeah. there's a side of me that is kind of waiting for that to happen with instagram also like i you know i particularly owe a lot to instagram in the beginning and we as you know danny and myself as as partners and then, you know, starting this 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 kind of endeavor that we started, yeah, we owe a lot. So I I kind of understand, but like I totally understand the good part of it. Um, and what you were saying, the the effect of it being, you know, these newer generations of artists that have been able to feed from like so much, you know, fantastic work, socializing, you know, through this app. Um, that's probably what you saw. You saw like a generation of people that had access to great work. And that part is, that part is incredible. That part is like, yes, this is the potential. Like this is the nice, like if you, if you, if you just look at the good side of the story, you say, yes, this is the, you know, the human, you know, like the humanist view of this, where we just push each other and, you know, where we're just, um, exciting each other. And, um, 
and and you have like this sense of discovery, like constant discovery. Because I, I remember that of early of my early Instagram. It was like every yeah. time I would open, I was like, "Who the hell is this? And who's this?" Yeah. I was like, "Oh my god, where where have these people been all my life?" Um, uh, but that that's sadly, it's you know, it's I don't know if we've just normalized it or if it's gone or or I don't know if we realize that we are a community after all. And then maybe we're not as big like the art, the like arts community is not as large as we think it is. It's a very it, niche yeah. thing. So I don't know if it's, we're hitting like. Yeah. I can definitely attest to the like arts world's not being big, like as soon as, and it must be similar in like New York, but as soon as you start like meeting people in, in London who are like artists and stuff, everybody like knows everybody um, or has been to like a private view or a gallery opening or a lesson or something with somebody. Um, and it just sort of, it becomes very, very sort of, oh yeah, this is a very small community. Really. Yeah, it's quite niche. Um, that, that's the game I play when we see um, port uh, Portraits uh, Artist of the Year. Yeah, yes. I'm like, oh, let me no, see, I, I let me see what people I know. And I'm like, oh, I know this person. Oh my God, I know this person. And it's just funny because, yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy. Like, and I root for people that I know. I, I was rooting for you. Uh, I was like, OK, well, come on, Tommy. Come on. I, I, um, I met Neil um, yeah. that day and he recognized me from like Instagram, the Kenyo cats and stuff. Yeah. We started chatting and stuff. And like, um, yeah, Neil uh, Cunning, he's like fantastic artist. Yeah. Um, Scottish, though. You know, yeah, I know. It's terrible, I know. Really. I um, know. I mean, they're infecting Kenya. There, there has to, yeah, sadly, there has to be um, a downside to all of that. Sadly, no, Neil is great. Yeah, yeah. I, I, con I congratulated him on 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 his painting uh, as soon as we saw the show because oh, that's a proper good painting. That I was like, yeah, no, yeah, definitely. That's a really good painting. How is like okay? So you've been um, you've been there twice. How was yeah. it like? How was it for you first time? You know, which I'm, I'm, because I've heard Milo's take on first on on his first time. I've heard a bunch of people's takes on on, on their first time. But how was it for you? Because I remember I also watched your episode. Um, I don't know if I watched it live though, because I don't know if people were pirating that show enough that I could find it easily back then. Yeah. But now it's super no. easy. Uh, but how was it for you first time? And how was it coming back? And and what changed? And if I could say something first and then I'll let you go. I think the lighting is horrendous, dude. I have no yeah. idea how you guys are painting like under um, 14 lights. Like whenever I see what you people are seeing, I'm like, I would struggle like crazy with this light. Like there's so many light sources, so many temperatures. The, the, the shapes of shade are so weird. I'm always like, oh, I don't know how you guys are doing this. This is not easy at all, at all. I thought also Preslav did like the yes. fucking most amazing dog I've ever seen painted live. I was like, how are you doing this, Preslav? Like, yeah. that is proper difficult. That it was way more difficult than to paint the portrait. But anyway, no, yeah, for sure. yeah, you go, he, you um, go. He he absolutely killed that. Oh, that amazing! Well. It was so good. Um. But no, yeah, it's it's definitely like it's a really strange day, as like anyone would think. Like it's not a normal day, um, and uh, you get there for like seven in the morning, mm -hmm. and you th you're there until like seven p.m. Um, so good. you're there for twelve hours. Yeah, that's a long day. Uh, and uh, if you're like, so the first time. Um, I came like out from like I traveled up. So it's like an hour and a half to travel to London for where I live. Mm -hmm. So I left at like five o'clock in the morning um, to have a day like that. And it's just so long. Um, whereas sort of the second time I was like, no, I'm just going to pay for a hotel in London um, yeah, yeah. and be able to sleep. So I definitely felt like uh, better rested um, yeah. for the second day or the second time. But um it is just a in very intense sort of experience where you are sort of constantly doing things throughout the day um, that just require a lot of like thought. Mm -hmm. um, so because like no one wants to sound like an idiot um, oh, I would or say that. anything. I would have that down. 
Well, it's I mean, I think that they're quite they're quite kind as editors, mostly, um, and sort of don't include a lot of the like stupid things that people say. Um, or like they didn't definitely didn't for me. So um it's like, yep, okay. Probably shouldn't have said that. That probably was like just a stupid thing to say um in general. Um and I'm very glad that it got like over like wasn't gonna be broadcast so everybody can see how stupid you are, you know? And it's like um it's always that sort of fear before it um before it comes out on TV that like, oh what if they give me like a villain edit? Mm. So like what if they what if they like want to to like paint someone as the bad guy um or something and it's like oh because it must happen in in some scenarios like it must some people must get sort of a a, sure. a sort of it's a show still I mean they have to make it about yes about painting but also about characters so yeah for sure they have to make it like entertaining that way I I totally see that like it doesn't. At times, it's not so much. I, I guess it was. It's like the BP portrait um, used to be, that sometimes it's not so much about the best paintings. Although the, there's obviously great, great, great painters that um, that uh, that go into those shows. But but you you start to realize, oh no, there's a narrative here. Like there has to be yes. this narrative to these shows, and it's fantastic if you not only do a great painting. But you fit that narrative because then it's going to be like a shoe in. That's it's going to be super simple for them to make their you know make up their minds as to you know if yeah. they they accept you or not. But it, sometimes when they don't accept you, you, you and you see the show, you you have to realize like you have to say, okay, I'm either not there yet, like I'm not good enough, or you have to. Or, but I think many times you can say, okay, I can understand why I wouldn't fit into this. Like why it yeah. is better for them to pick you know, these other people for this. So I, and I think that that happens with, with that show, not to say that there's not, again, there's not great painters. I have to say that many times, like people that are my favorite painters, they don't go through. And I guess, you know, it's, it's a show. So whatever, you know, it's, it's like trying to put three people, like, I'm sure that that's also very difficult, like three different people trying to say, okay, let's pick, you know, together um, who goes through but um, but it's fun. I always saw it as as like fun. I I've, I always thought that if I had to go, dude, I would have to probably train for six months. I would say, you know. Well, so that's definitely sort of part of the thing is that like I have always I've always sort of like painted from photos um and stuff, and like I only really started painting from life when I first went to the art academy up in London. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first started studying there, it was suddenly very clear that it was like, oh, I, I have taught myself how to paint from photos, um, which is a very different sort of set of uh, skills than it is from painting from life. Um, and it's just, it's one of the things that I've sort of always wanted to put more time into painting from life, but it's, it's, generally quite um sort of difficult to set up and like sort of like get get around um yeah. I sort of throughout like just before sort of the you know that you're going on I've always sort of been like yep yeah, I'm gonna do 20 portraits from life um and like this time I did like two um and it was my girlfriend and her little brother um and it was like that was all the practice that I got um but uh, I definitely would want to sort of have some time to do some prep beforehand because I, I mean, I, I mentioned it to you the other day that like, I just want to go on and do something that's like objectively great. Um, mm. And it, I don't care if I don't win or anything. I just want it to be like, Oh yeah, this is a fantastic piece of art. Um, uh, and I sort of felt uh, like I've not done that. So I'm sort of like not quite scratched that itch. Well, that's um, that's quite a goal that you've set for yourself. So well, I mean, I mean it's, it's a it, that's tough. It's Bobby. definitely sort of. I, I've definitely seen people go on and do it. So it's it's one of the things. Right, right. I know right. it's doable. Right. Um, uh, and sort of like, I sort of that's my my like engagement with it at this point. I think it's like that's what I would want to be doing on it rather than sort of. 
um like getting through to the end or whatever i just like one really good painting and sort of be like yeah i'm out um that's good i've sort of proved that i could do it um to myself and then sort of allow it to be whatever um i still think that the the conditions i mean there's there's certainly like people that oof I, I, um, last episode, uh, there's this woman, I forget her name. I, I even like, um, I had to write to her. Let me, let me look for this, uh, message that I sent her because I didn't know of her. Um, okay. Let me see. Let me see. I'm, I'm scrolling through my messages here. Uh, Benny Matthews. Oh my okay. God. Oh my God. She did a, she did like a, you know, really quite a big painting for, for something like that has to be executed in four hours. It's crazy how big that was. And she not only did like a proper good big painting, but it was a great likeness, great composition. I was shocked. I was like, I, I, I you know, right now I could tell you, and even when I was painting larger, I don't know if I could pull that off in four hours. Like that's, that is not, that is not easy. That is not easy. She blew me away. I was like, Whoa. yeah. It's it's almost like every single little decision that she made was like spot on, was good. Well, I'm not, I don't know if spot on in terms of like being faithful or not, but just in the construction of the painting, it was just spot on. And I was like, oh God, I, I maybe because I'm not that sort of painter and I just like start plopping things like, you know, all over the place and a lot of times they're wrong and then I adjust. But when I, I was watching her work, I was like, oof, this is not easy. And she also was, I mean, she, she did, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, maybe she had some help with, I don't think she gridded her whole canvas because that was a really big surface. But, um, but she did start to put like, you know, very slate school, like mark making. Um, and and that's, that's like the downside of that show, I feel, at least for me. That of course it's super nice that it's it's open to like you know people that are professional artists, people that studied art, people that you know had art adjacent careers, and also people that you know they they just go to painting courses or workshops or maybe they're self taught. I think that that's amazing. You know, young, old, that kid that like went through in 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 one of those um, a couple of days ago, a couple of shows ago. Like that kid is good. That kid's proper good for like a nineteen year old. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So it's really fun. No, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, super. I'm super happy for that kid. Like to to just watch him go through that. That's so super super cool. But my big but with that show is that there's so much weight put on, and and it, you can kind of understand it because the the end goal is to have like a you know sort of an official painter, a painter that's going to be exhibited at the uh, National Portrait Gallery. So, um. So you can understand why they have to be good at doing portraits, but there's so much weight put on likeness. And I think yeah. that's where the, the show is kind of stumbles a little bit that it just makes people, you know, immediately take out a, a um, their iPad or, you know, a, a camera or have their computer right next to them. And then immediately just grid it on Photoshop or grid it on whatever app you're using and then grid your canvas. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I totally understand that that's how we work. Like, that's fine. That's how we've worked for now for, well, gridding forever. But, but in terms of like, you know, transferring images uh, or photographic images onto substrates, you know, that's, that's been us for, for, for many decades now. So I, I kind I understand it and it has to be a valid way to work. But when so much like weight is put on, on that, I think that there's like a lost opportunity to see how people that if they weren't really judged so heavily upon like likeness, um, that maybe you, you would see people taking more chances and just doing like far yeah. more expressive paint, which I think that that would be cool because it broadens, you know, it, it gives them what they want, which is like every artist almost becoming like their own little story that, oh my God, look what they're doing. Look what he's doing. Look what she's doing. Um, yeah, that, that would be the only thing. It's, it's a little, not sad, but it's, you know, I, I don't like a competition where if I were going to it, 
I would have to battle those demons and say, do I grid this? Because I know it makes it easier for me. I know the people that are there posing, fantastic people, human beings, great achievements, you know, that's what they look for in their sitters. But they're not good at being sitters. They're not yeah, disciplined definitely. sitters, you could tell. So it's it only makes everything harder on you. So, you know, I can totally understand why people are like, I just I just have to take a photo and be done with this. Like I, I just don't want to go through this because you know, it doesn't it's not gonna take me anywhere. If anything, it's just gonna hinder my my the possibility that I can go through. Um, yeah, so whenever I see like everyone taking out their phone and everyone just um then gritting, I'm like, yeah, sure, sure. But it's like, uh, I, I always enjoy the most the people that are like, okay, let's go for it. Let's not, let's do this. And I think it would yeah. be for me, it would be like a big struggle to see if I, I would have to have like something super clear in my brain, which is like, am I here to like try to make a cool painting and have fun and just, you know, just go through this experience or do I want to come here to win and like, yeah. you know, proper win, whatever it takes, do, you know, do what other people are doing. It doesn't matter. Like if that gives you a best, the best chance to win, do it because you're dumb if you don't do it. If you want to win and there's things that you can do to give yourself a good shot at winning, then do them. But I think I would struggle with that a lot. So I think I would be the sort of person that I would just go there and say, you know what? I think I'm at my best when I enjoy painting, when I just fucking yeah. enjoy it. I'm just there and I'm like, okay, this is a challenge and fuck. Yeah, let's do this. Like, let's challenge, let me challenge myself. And that, because I go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. That that's sort of exactly how I feel about it. It's like, oh yeah, that's, let's sort of like because it's like a test essentially it's like you have to sort of you're given this parameters of creating a, a piece of artwork um and sort of you either can sort of get on and do it or you can't and sort of like it's a sort of skill that you can learn to sort of like yep yeah, i can just go and do a bit of good work um and like now generally i think that i do less uh bad paintings than i used to i do def definitely definitely do still do bad paintings but like they're a bit more infrequent um than when i was like starting out or when i was like two years into my career um and it's sort of like part of it is just uh, am i gonna do am i gonna be able to do a good painting on the day um and because you you just don't know because like um with the first time uh that i did it uh, I painted um, Omar Jilly from like Gladiator and sort of he's a uh, comedian in the UK in general but like he um, was a terrible terrible sitter he was so fidgety and it's like he's a he's like a upbeat sort of like busy comedian so it sort of makes perfect sense that that's exactly what you imagine him to be mm -hmm. Uh and then sort of the second time over, I was like, okay, no, yeah, I know that these people aren't sitters. Um, they aren't sort of in that world at all. Like a lot of them haven't been painted um, from their knowledge. Like I'm sure lots of them get like online portraits painted of them and stuff. But like uh, they, yeah, exactly. They aren't sitters. Um, so you sort of have to do everything so this time i thought like yep yeah, it's fine i'll bring like a polaroid i'll take a polaroid picture and then i sort of have a little bit of a reference um and uh sort of i can just lean on that a bit uh which sounded like a great idea in theory mm -hmm. um until the polaroid started to develop and they wanted to film it so they moved the massive boom camera right in front of my station mm -hmm. and just filmed the Polaroid developing um, for the first like 40 minutes, um, which I was sort of like, oh, I should have not done this. I should have had the, the time sort of to paint instead of having the Polaroid. Um, but it's like, OK, I know that for next time I can sort of not do that and just get straight on with the painting um but again it's sort of it is one of those things it's like okay what 
what do I need to sort of make a good painting? Mm -hmm. Like, do I need my setup? Um, do I need like my specific brushes or do I need like a specific surface? Um, and sometimes I just really want to see if that's true for myself. Just like, whatever, give me, give me like, the worst plasticky oil paint you can find um and crap surface crap brushes and i'll give it a go and if it isn't working then i sort of want to know why it's not working and work on that um because i just find it very personally sort of like interesting to sort of solve those problems mm -hmm. but um it's it's definitely like not the space to try and solve those problems right um like yeah okay you sort of should have a better plan but I, i've definitely i've seen artists sort of do exactly what um you mentioned and sort of go in with like okay i'm going in i'm gonna try and win um and they they do everything that they can to win yeah um and yeah. they definitely get far um and then sort of it, like it does really help some people's careers as well so it's like sure yeah okay i can sort of see why you're doing this um because you've got the right sort of personality to sort of come through the painting sort of as a like oh yes they triumph over triumph over the painting and uh everything was was good in painting world that day but have you had yeah, a, a like a favorite from that show either, um, I, either somebody who's won or somebody who's like you know, maybe they've they've gone far in into the competition, but haven't uh, haven't won. But you've been like, oh, that's a proper cool painting. Um, so I definitely, obviously, uh, there's Milo. Um, yeah. Like Milo did a fantastic painting on the second time he was there. Um, but uh, I don't think Milo would would ever get put through um, <laughs> the 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 day. But that's different set of circumstances. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think deep down, I, I think deep down, I don't know if he would want to go and win that. Thing. No, I don't think. He I don't think either. he. I don't. I don't think he would. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think he's quite happy, sort of not um, being in that space. Uh, but like Ewan McClure, uh, who was on the first yes. season, I mean, he's a he great did. painter. Yeah, um, some really fantastic painting, and like it's very strange because I see a lot of people that like. I know in the London art scene and sort of like have been tutors and um, sort of, they just pop up occasionally and it's like, Oh yeah, um, I'm definitely going to be rooting, rooting for you. Um, I, and I sort of, I have a, a huge uh, soft spot for Ty as well. Um, yeah. Ty yeah. Yeah. He's amazing. Uh, uh, because uh, he was my first oil painting tutor. No way. Um, no yeah, way. So he, oh dude nice he, he used to teach um at the art academy where i teach now um and i was so so fortunate in my first year i had both ty and um brendan kelly oh has, dude come on that's like um, yeah and that's um sort of best it's painters interesting. that you could have ever had this is sort of uh leading to to one of the questions that i wanted to talk to talk to you about oh there's um, questions what the hell well Tommy? sort of opinions Jesus opinions Christ. On... i'm not good i'm not ready for this i'm sorry i didn't prep for this um, i'm kidding i'm kidding. um but uh when like ty was uh a, like a painter a tutor of mine that like really taught me to love like the physicality mm -hmm. of oil paint um and sort of like what oil paints like body and sort of reaction was sort of significant for sort of responding to um and like brendan kelly was sort of an artist that really told me to sort of love color mm -hmm. um and i'm sort of curious as, as to if you've got any sort of uh tutors that you've had or sort of uh like art uh teachers or anything that really sort of gave you these standout lessons um in how you think about painting now Oof. um I mean, I always talk about my, well, I mean, they weren't my only two teachers, but what I, the, the people that I considered were the two artists that were responsible for me falling in love with painting for sure. 
which are Steve Assell and Max Ginsburg. Um, yeah. And I've always uh, spoken about how they are forever going to be immense in my brain because, you know, when I when I saw them paint, I, it was when I realized that I wanted to do what they were doing. So yeah. for me, there's no nothing bigger than that. If somebody is just, if somebody becomes that person that does something and, and you have clarity in your life as to what you want to do, like you suddenly say, that's my life. You know, what yeah. they're, what they are doing, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. I don't know if there's anything bigger than that. I don't know if there's any lesson that could beat that. Any, you know, lesson yeah. about color or about expressiveness or about, I don't know. You could nominate whatever, um, you know, attribute you can give to painting. But but the fact that they, they just, um, they were capable of, like, you know, making me open my eyes to painting, like broaden my eyes yeah. to painting. I don't know. I don't know if you could get bigger than that. So that's why they'll hold forever, like that space in my, like in my heart, my mind, my body. They're like my teachers, you know, I'll, I'll forever yeah. call them my teachers. And, um, and the, the funny, sad, but amazing thing is that I don't really paint like any of them like any of the two of them yeah. right right now. So you could argue that um, maybe the lessons were so well implanted in me that um, that I, I'd like to believe that I became my own artist. You know, I'd yeah. like to believe that eventually, you know, I can say I had Steve and I had Max and then my, pa and how much I care for them and adore them and, and, and how important they are in, in my development but I don't see them anymore in my work. And that's, it took yeah. me a long time for them not to show up in my work. You know, it was, um, first uh, Steve's work, for example, was just like omnipresent in everything that I used to do. And up to the point where it's like, I love my teacher, but fucking it, like, come on. Like, don't. Yeah. Cause every time somebody would comment on my painting, they would go like, oh, you probably had Steve, right? As a teacher. And I was like, yeah. what? Is it that evident? Like, is it, am I that like easy to, to um, figure out just a bad version of my teacher? That's what I am. And um, it used to frustrate me like crazy. It just, um, it was one of those things. It's not like an ego thing. It's just that so much of painting is like, you know, finding your own voice and having like the courage to, to, want to develop that voice and then having even more courage to try to socialize that voice. Um, so much is it about, it, it, it is about, you know, getting to know yourself and, and feeling okay with who you are, okay with what you want to say. Or, um, that it's very, you know, um, defeating almost when you, when you hear somebody say, oh, it's not your voice yet. Like you, you're, yeah. you're not there yet. Like you can totally see, I can totally see where you come from. And it's not that we don't, like we, we don't, I think paintings denounce where they come from for sure. Like even it's, it's not, um, I mean, you can make very educated guesses as to who is um, influencing people even right now. I mean, there's like, um, I would say in this like contemporary sort of intimist uh, figurative painting, you know, contemporary painting, I mean, there's so much of like uh, Bonnard and, and Villard everywhere in those paintings. It's crazy how much they show up. I mean, it's so easy to identify like people looking at, um, which is kind of nice also because they're looking at, you know, mid 20th century painting basically, or, or like the the early half until the, the, the middle of the 20th century. And it's not just devoured by Matisse or uh, Picasso. So it's, yeah. it's really, really nice to see that, oh, you know, these two other painters were beasts, were like enormous beasts. And, you know, they've been like on the back burner for so many decades. Like, what if we just look at them? And what if we just, you know, uh, build our painting around them? And I'm so happy that so many people are doing that. But you can smell it, like you can you can tell how we are connected. Um, but I also feel that it's part of the artist's um, 
responsibility to also say I'm it's like it's like you're tethered but you want to swim as far as you can from that shore you are going to be tethered yeah. like there is like maybe this lifeline connected to you and and or it's giving you oxygen or something but it is your job to say swim as far as you as far out as you can like swim um like Gattaca swim as far out as you can and you have to swim back like um it's i think that's our job i think i really do and and we it, have to figure out what it means to push like we have to that's that's just yeah. you know you you spend your whole lifetime trying to say like okay pushing for this other person means like doing these crazy ass paintings like doing these things that i can't even imagine doing and maybe for me pushing means this just playing around with little color like little variations of hues and that's enough for me and you have to be okay yeah. with that and you have to you know you have to say nope this is this is good i'm going to build my whole you know i'm going to build a whole series of paintings around this little idea um so we all i think we all have to do that we all have to kind of figure that out so i don't know so like going back to what you asked I'm, i i don't think i have like particular lessons that anyone in you know any one of my teachers gave me i i probably have lessons that i've interiorized from painters that i've just decided to you know endlessly lose myself you know in 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 their paintings and and then try to try to understand how i can gain some sort of experience or knowledge from what they did i probably have those sort of painters um yeah but um but yeah for my teachers directly for my teachers i think i it was good enough for them to just be like the catalysts you know to 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 be the 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 two people that set everything in motion and and then that's you know i was like yeah that's good enough for me that's great it's it's definitely really interesting though because i sort of i feel like i'm sort of getting to that stage of like okay yeah these these are things that i want to be working on these are things that i sort of want to be exploring um and sort of this is the way that i sort of want to be sort of pushing that work as you sort of mentioned sort of like making it like this is what i'm studying at the moment this is what i'm interested in this is what i'm sort of really trying to engage with um and i feel like it's the most clear that it's ever been mm -hmm. for the, like i think i sort of was working it out the other day i sort of started painting in oils at the age of like 22 23 ish mm -hmm. um which was like back in uh 2014 or something um and i'd always always sort of drawn and um had painted quite a lot with my grandfather at the time um and sort of it's uh, it's taken a very very long time um to sort of be at a stage where it's like yep this is sort of my voice or sort of my voice for now um mm -hmm. and sort of like what i want to be doing um but it's i i fully agree that sometimes it's just been like okay if i'm an artist that's interested in sort of brevity of mark making then sort of what does that look like mm -hmm. um or if i'm an artist that's sort of like really interested in um light which is sort of where it is at the moment sort of like what does that look like and sort of how is is that showing itself in my work but it's it's not easy i don't think um mm -hmm. to sort of get to those stages and i sort of feel that it's thought to be easier rather than uh, than it is because sort of we expect artists to sort of decide that uh quite quite quickly i think or it's sort of at least expected in some circles that people sort of have this really solid idea of exactly how they want to engage with painting um sort of from from the beginning and it's just i just don't think that's uh the best way to in, sort of uh, set those parameters because it you sort of have to have that time that people can figure it out at their own sort of pace and a lot of that for me was like learning how like the mechanics of oil paint was working right like if you do this sort of you paint on this surface with this brush and the brush is this consistent like the paint is this consistency what sort of mark does that make right. and that's what i engaged with for for years of like painting 
um, because I felt like I had to be sort of uh, apt enough in order to start to describe what I wanted to, des- to describe. Yeah, um, I've always been but, in- yeah. inept enough. I feel yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah it but it's it must be sort of like do you see it um sort of from the other side as well of like how sort of your own work is influencing sort of artists of the time just sort of even from very like physical things like suddenly everyone painting on paper um i definitely feel like or like painting in moleskins i definitely feel like um that's been quite uh helped alongside with like your work sort of to and and the, allow. and the only reason i painted moleskins is because james jean I saw James right. Jean working on moleskins, you know, when I when I was growing up as an artist uh, in school, and right. probably my favorite. I mean, I used to have a ton of books, but from the very small number that I kept, um, one of my favorite books is uh, James Jean, the 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 uh, Process Recess. I think it's called Process Recess Three, if I'm not mistaken. That it's like a collection of his uh, moleskin sketchbook. Right. Uh, the okay. only reason, the only reason I ended up just going into my sketchbook was just the, you know, feeling of being absolutely enamored and and just the the pull that that book had on me and that watching James work had on me. Um, it, it's it was immeasurable. I feel so. I always joke that Moleskin should you know should give James something. Because the really the person that made people go back into a sketchbook, I think, was James. Um, right. I think he knows it. I think most people know it. I mean, Moleskin was a thing that was. I mean, it was so niche. It was. It was so. So I mean, it was big. You know, in the twentieth century, like uh, uh, middle to mid twentieth century, it was. It, then it was just a very small thing that had to be bought out. If I'm not mistaken, that business was, they were going out of business and it had to be bought out. Um, right. And, um, and now it's, uh, you know, now when people think of sketchbooks, they, they certainly, you know, think of uh, particularly artists, they think of those sketchbooks. And um, now for me, it was, it was the meeting of that. And I have a very particular story. I've told this before, but uh for me, it was it was just circumstantial because yes, there is like this part of my brain that just remembers James just treating his sketchbooks like yes, like they were a sketchbook, but but also saying like I'm gonna make a fucking kick ass drawing here, which he found the perfect balance because I've also found people that treat sketchbooks as if they are they pretty much like just stretch something like you could just take that and put it on like some stretcher bars and then put a frame on it and then you're good. Yeah. Um, and, and so part of like the sketchbook quality is gone when you feel that it has to be super precious, that every single page that you're working on has to be very, very precious. Um, I think James always struck this balance and because he did it so effortlessly and because it, it was so organic for him that, um, that his work just felt like, oh yeah, this is part of his sketchbook. Like this, he feels bold in his in his sketchbook. He writes in his sketchbook. He tries to figure things out in his sketchbook. Like he's taking chances in his sketchbook. He's doing good drawings, bad drawings. Like he's, you know, it was that sort of thing where you were like, oh my God, like this is crazy. This is, I, I, I very rarely saw before James, somebody like taking a sketchbook so far, like so yeah. damn far. And the other side of of that equation for me, because it didn't stop like that because I was, even though I graduated as an illustrator and I had like dreams about comic books, like I was never as good as James or I, I I kind of knew that I wasn't good enough to, to fit into that career. But with painting, I always felt like, okay, my, my visual narrative just sucks. My ability to tell a story through like visual beats uh, sucks, but I think I'm good at trying to portray what my universe would look like in a painting. So if you have a, if you can have a snapshot of your universe of that world that that you're trying to um, um, to translate into painting, I was like, I think I can do this. And in that search of like those soul sort of images that I thought could 
become like windows to like a bigger universe, like that could within themselves tell like a bigger story, I guess. Um, I, I traveled a ton looking for, you know, images that I would see in a book. It could be like super obscure. And I would be like, oh, this painting by Eugene Carrière. I want to see this painting. So whenever I can, if I have the money, and it, I was very lucky to do really good on it, really well on shows, that I would then take that money and then travel, spend it traveling. Just, right. But I would travel, I would always travel searching for paintings. Like that was my thing. Like I would always just be like, oh, I'm going to the city. And it's like, what? Where are you going there? It's like, oh, they have this painting. And that was like yeah. the sole reason for me. And I was, that was reason enough for me to take a train into like a city that I, you know, people wouldn't speak English and it didn't matter. I was like, nope, my day is to, like the objective of my day is to just, you know, book it and go to this painting. Like that's the one thing I want to see. And um, I've told how when I went to Poland, um, you know, I was all about looking at uh, Jacek Malszewski and uh, Jan Mateko's work. Because if you look, yeah. there's, they, they're probably like the two biggest, like, well, Mateko being like a well, symbolist painter, but that's not really like an ism. But, you know, he's like a like a allegorical painter. And Mateko being like um, um, uh, a, a historical painter, like probably the biggest historical painter, you know, in, in Polish history. And I wanted to see, I remember the first one I wanted to see after seeing the Sobieski painting at the Vatican, I wanted to see the uh, Grunewald battle at, um, yeah. that they had at, uh, in, um, in Warsaw. So, you know, I, I, th there's a bunch of like Malszewskis that are better in uh, Krakow. That's, it's, it's a better place to, to go and, and look at Malszewskis, but but for Mateko, I was like, no, I got to go see this painting. It's like one of the, it's probably one of the largest easel paintings also ever. I think it's 10 meters long. It's something ridiculous like that. It's like nine and a half meters long, something like that. Right. It's, it's absurd. And while I was at this museum, that's just like a, you know, sadly, like many things in Poland that are just like a big rock, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it, it's so much of Poland is so sad because it was, it was destroyed. It was absolutely destroyed that it feels like super simple ar architecture, kind of um, fake architecture. A lot of royal castles had to be rebuilt, but instead of like marble, it's like stucco or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but in, in this huge museum, that's like, you know, this, this, this imposing place, I was in, and going back and forth to, to wanting to see this painting, I would always stop at an Olga Woznanska, you know, which I had yeah. no idea. Like there were no books. I mean, what books were there on Polish painting? Nothing. I mean, my teachers, they, I mean, I felt blessed that they taught, they taught us about like itinerant painters, like Russian itinerant painters, like, uh, Kramskoy and, uh, Serov and Repin and, um, uh, Shishkin, Surikov, like, you know, those amazing painters. I was so happy that they taught us that uh, or they showed us that. One of my one of my teachers being, he said, like Max Ginsburg said that his family was uh, Russian. Like if he went far back, it was like a, a, a Jewish Russian immigrant. So so he had like that connection with Russia. Uh, and, and he had gone to Russia when it was weird for an artist to go seek these things for like a Westerner to go seek these things. And he brought some books and he showed it to us and, and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing, but we never got to see anything even close to like the Polish painting. Like I had, I knew nothing yeah. about Polish painting, nothing. And, um, and when I saw Boznanska, I, it was just, it's one of those things, Tommy, that, you know, like I think this is a story for all of for e and the story is different for each one of us. But when I saw her, I was like, I am put in this universe to feel like I am going to be moved the most by this artist. Like, that, yeah. like, it's almost like this was meant to be. I was meant to go there and meant to search for Mateko and Malshevsky and I was meant to eventually find Olga Woznanska and I was meant to then like, she was then meant to change everything in me, like everything. And that's what happened. And, and I became obsessed with like this very obscure painter. This was probably one of the most talented painters I've ever seen. Um, but super obscure, obviously, 
you know, there there's reasons because, you know, she was a woman in, in the late 19th century. And that kind of hindered where she was able to study, you know, through Europe. There were schools that were only for uh, women at that time. Um, but she was she was incredible. She was absolutely incredible. And one of the things that just, you know, tortured my soul was that she would paint on cardboard, on just this yeah. flimsy piece of cardboard. Like, you know, nowadays we're at least like, hey, this is acid free or this is like people can tell you, you know, hey, this this paper is archival, you know, shit like that. I don't think those words existed in the yeah. 1900s. <laughs> like it was just cardboard and it's probably like the most acidic piece of cardboard that you'll ever see. Um, and um, I just couldn't, I just, I, there, there's a lot of paintings that even though I can't paint that way anymore, but I, I was educated painting like traditionally and I, I can't paint yep. indirectly. And I, I do feel like I'm some, I mean, not, I'm not a great painter when I do indirect painting, but, but I get it and I know how to do it. And, um, you know, when you see great paintings, they blow you away because they, they obviously always do. And part of it is their execution. And part of it also has to do with you noticing like what has to be done to execute something. And you go like, oh my God, that's so much control or so much like yeah. wisdom in those decisions. And, but you understand it. But with Bosnanska, it's one of those times that I've, you know, st stood in front of a painting. I'm like, I have no fucking clue. I like, I have no idea what's going on in this painting. And it was only until I started to say, you know what? I'm, you know, if she painted on a fucking piece of cardboard, why is it so important for me to prime a d every damn substrate that I paint? Like, why yeah. is it that I'm just like, I have to do it. I have to, it has to be done. It has to, it has to, it has to. Oh, you're going to sell it. You're being irresponsible. Oh, you're going to, you want to keep it for, x number of years you're being you know stupid by not doing it and i was like what if you just say fuck it like what if you just say you know what it doesn't matter it just doesn't matter it it really doesn't for me like i know that these weights that we that, that are put on top of us and especially in terms of dumb questions like you know leaving a leg like having a legacy or just leaving something behind for other people or i i, I don't know like I've never liked art in those terms, never. Yeah. Um, and I had to, it, it was weird for me to say, I'm just going to start to paint on this stupid piece of paper and I'm not going to prime it and I don't care. And um, and that's it. And I when I started doing that, I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was like, there, there was this little bit of something that I started to feel that, I mean, I'm not Olga Oznanska, so let's make that just absolutely clear here. Um, she's like, you know, a thousand times the painter that I'll ever be. She could, you know, paint circles around me doing absolutely anything she ever painted. But, but from a technical standpoint, I could understand, I could start to understand some of the things that I loved when I saw her work. Yeah. And and it it was just because it was a raw surface. Like that was the fucking like reason and maybe some people go like yeah that's not enough for me you know i'm sorry but that's not enough for me like fine it looks good but that's a responsible painting and i would say for me it's everything i would be like sure i get it for you yeah that in your path in your story for you it means nothing for you it means you're being irresponsible for me it's everything because yeah. that's the yeah. difference between you going past and Olga Oznanska and saying maybe, oh, that's a cool painting. And me being like, oh my fucking God, my world has been shook. Like, like my world has been turned upside down by this painter. That's the difference. And I have to I, be true to that difference. So, yeah. I, I only got introduced to Olga's work through one of your live streams. Um, mm. And I ended up doing a, a lot of research on her because again i did i thought oh my a similar sort of uh extent like apart from my grandfather i've never who wasn't uh he was like a very happy amateur painter but like uh, i've sort of never known any polish artists mm. um and it was just very like oh there is things like that in poland um that i just never really sort of 
had been introduced to right um and it was just it was very sort of it, it's similar sort of thing it was a very sort of like uh important sort of moment to happen yeah um but you're exactly right right sort of trying to look her up even isn't the easiest thing to do like there are some in- images but it's nowhere near like sort of like a sergeant's um sort of like amount of information that you can find about her or anything it's like so you sort of are really limited to to what you can garner from her in that sort of um sense you are only really sort of looking at the paintings and responding to the paintings which is sometimes all you need um right like that's oh yeah and and for for a lot of us it's going to be the only thing like i wish i could just tell you that i've been able to travel and see every single work of art that i've ever wanted to see but that's not quite true i mean um so many times we just we kind of have to hold on to to that little image and imagine the rest like imagine yeah um which is probably like super exciting too the way we reconfigure a painting in our brains and we try to convince ourselves like oh this this must be this way this painting has to be this way and then when we if we or when we um eventually see the the actual painting like there's so many things that are just off or so many ideas that were just wrong or maybe at that moment we just it, everything just like reshuffles for us in our brain yeah. and it's like okay this is not what i thought it was but it doesn't matter like it's a new it's a completely new experience now um yeah i'm always i'm always um saddened by that fact that painting well, sad, well, both sad and excited. I guess exciting that that an image can be so powerful that it can drive people throughout their lives. Um, I'm reminded of like um, uh, Franklin Booth, who's a, who's an American illustrator. He he didn't know how um, the engravings that you would see in books or in newspapers were done. He didn't know what engraving was because he was self taught. Right. So he thought they were pen and ink drawings. And he started doing pen and ink drawings, trying to emulate how engravings, how wood engravings would look. And, um, and I thought that that was, you know, that's incredible because that's what eventually made his work, you know, become his own. Um, and it, if you want to be, you know, very objective about it, it came from ignorance. It came from just, you know, looking at something with innocence. Uh, but then like, I mean, it's so backwards to say, oh, I these are pen and ink drawings, so I'm going to try to emulate this hatchwork, this super weird, intricate hatchwork that was so, I mean, not easy, but it was ubiquitous with like uh, engraving tools. Um, but to think that you have to translate that into pen and ink, it's crazy. It's really insane that he he had he, you know, he eventually did that which is incredible. So an image can be super powerful, like an image um, digested through like a a kind of uneducated lens can be super, super powerful. But there there is also that thing that you say, oh, wait till you see the painting. Like, oh, you haven't seen it. Like if you've never seen Raft of the Medusa, oh, wait till you see that painting because that's a whole like different experience. And that's also true. So... I guess that's the wonderful thing about art that it can work at so many levels, you know, and, and painting being um, both of a very, very powerful image. Although, you know, probably today's definition of painting um, doesn't come close to like the historical definition of painting in terms of its historic, like it's um, the, the relevance that it had as, um, yeah, as image, like as, as holding like the sole definition of what an image was, um, like painting is is long, you know that that power has been long gone from painting for a while now, but it's still very very powerful. I feel so. Yeah, no, it it's one of those things as well that like you can really start to uh, sort of as you say understand something uh, through a process led sort of experimentation which is so much better sometimes than sort of reading extensively about something. If you do just go, okay, I want to figure out how this mark is made in these paintings. Um, what do I need to do? Like what 
constraint do the paints need to be put under? Um, and it's like that's definitely been something that's um, at a lot of points of where I've been like lost of ways to in, like or sort of lost at things to sort of move into in terms of painting. That's just just been a thing that I've thought of. It's like okay, yeah, let's just try and figure out this. Um, and as a result, sort of you do start to sort of see paintings differently and sort of start to examine them mm -hmm. under sort of different criteria. And that is, that's been sort of the most uh, sort of helpful thing in terms of learning how to paint for myself, just sort of allowing myself to be in that mind space of like trying to solve a problem that is presented by painting. Um, and I love it. And it's like, I seek that out in painting. It's like, I want to seek out things to sort of figure out. Um, what did your grandfather used to do? I'm super curious. Like, even, uh, so even he, if it was amateur painting, like my grandfather, he, he studied in Vienna. He was a German, studied in Vienna as an artist, but he was also like an architect. You know, you know how those uh, people like um, uh, early 20th century, mid 20th century, they were just you know, artist meant that they could do everything. Like I'm sure yeah. if, if, if my grandfather had to like, you know, do wood carving, he would have been amazing. He, I, I know he did sculpture. I know he did, um, he drew, he painted, he was an architect. He, you know, it was a very complete definition of, of an artist. But I also, um, we have this painting at my mother's house of his. And, um, and it's like, uh, well, it, it eventually was hanging, going down some stairs. Um, but it's this big painting that's done on the back of like a masonite panel, which is very grungy, but because it has like a bunch of texture, like it's the the the, the back yeah. of old masonite panels had like a like almost like a felt. Uh, it, it was like a there were rigs to it, and it was very felty. I don't know. Um, right. But he painted on that side i guess because of the grab that the texture that he would get from it but i always thought i was like you know if my grandfather i mean he's dead but you know but so he he wouldn't be able to hear anything i'm saying but i yeah. I, I loved i would love to have a conversation with him i and i remember thinking about this when i was um young enough to understand what he was doing um or well young a young painter but old enough to understand what he was doing in in painting i was like why does the body why because it's a nude kind of like woman uh, sitting on the edge of a bed. Uh, and I was like, why is this painting? Like, why is the body good? Like the body is like, you know, it's not great, but it's a proper painting. Like you could tell that he was, yeah. he was understanding what he was doing. And when I would look at the face, I was like, but the face sucks. I was like, like grandfather, what ha what the hell happened here? Like, <laughs> why is there such a difference? So, and flash forward to, um, I don't know. The, the, I made this this discovery like probably eight years ago, something like that. I was looking through like uh, Gil Elfgren, who does like pinup work. He's like yeah. an American painter that does a bunch of pinup work. And I was like looking at, you know, really stuff. obscure because I, I knew in my mind, I knew a bunch of like Gil, Gil Elfgren uh, paintings. I even saw a bunch of Gil Elfgren's in, in New York. Um, but I was flipping through some images and I find this super obscure one. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like <laughs> the body is like, it's like completely copied from a Gil, a Gil Elfgren. And right. then, you know, it, it, everything made sense. Like the feet weren't showing in the painting. So my grandfather had to paint the feet and they're horrendous. The, the, he tried to turn, it was like a blonde, you know, uh, woman posing like a lot of uh, Elfgren uh, pinup girls. Uh, no, he turned it into like a dark haired with cur the, like dark haired woman with like her hair up and it's like curly and it was terrible. Like the hair was terrible. <laughs> the face was terrible. But I was like, oh, my God, I found it. it. It's it felt so cool. Like this tiny little mystery of why is my grandfather so good at something and then so sucky at other <laughs> things. And then I finally found the Elfgren and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? You just, you were copying a Gil Elfgren. Like that was it. I felt, I, it felt amazing. It felt so no, cool. I, I, I just, that's just such a funny story. And in, in the same way, I, I like, uh, yeah, I mean, I say amateur um, painter and like, I, I think it's more like, 
elective, elective amateur mm -hmm. because he never wanted anything to happen with these paintings. So he would paint sort of full time after he retired and sort of he did study painting at various points in his life, but he was never looking to sort of like do big exhibitions or anything. He was just happy painting and sort of he'd give all the paintings away to the family. And um, like if he were to sell them, they'd be like 200 pounds or something. And like lots of landscapes and sort of like scenery from West Sussex, sort of where we live. And um, he was he was particularly good at like perspective and sort of two point perspective, three point perspective and that sort of element. But um I always used to really uh, like his portraits, mm -hmm. um, but he hated portrait painting. Um, like he, he sort of loathed to do it, um, but he was really good at it when he did do it. But um, the the sort of whole story with it is just sort of very, very fascinating um, with sort of how he came to, to start painting um, because he he passed away in i want to say like 2018 or something 2017 mm. and was 97 or oh, something wow. He oh wow got very very good innings um in yeah uh, for sure but um it meant that at the beginning of the war in poland second world war um he was like 15 oh Jesus. and sort of had this uh experience with the war um in which he was sort of sent to family uh, and then ended up being sort of captured uh, and then eventually sort of escaped because something was bombed um, and then went from fr like hiked from France up to Spain and then got a boat over from Spain to the UK, um, joined the army in the UK and sort of continued fighting and sort of was in a Polish regiment in, uh, in the army. He was a signaller. Mm. Um, but he's uh, there was a member of his Polish regiment who um, was a painter, like his sort of corporal um, was a painter. And he's like, oh, you know, a you know, sort of a bit of drawing a bit. Do, do you want to paint sort of in our off time type thing? And they ended up painting. And then um, we've got we uh, or sorry, I've seen paintings of his. Um, which are just on the back of like it's just a bit of canvas stretched across like an army ration box oh, so um, good. and stuff and they were just dismantling things to get paintings ah. uh, like surfaces to paint on i love that um, and it's it's all very like yes this is so perfect of like just you were just doing whatever you could to paint because right. it just meant something to be painting for you um, and and the other sort of guys in the in the team as well, sort of in the regiment. Um, and I just thought it was like, yeah, this is sort of a good mentality to live by. And I sort of do like that idea of like, yeah, it doesn't matter what you're painting on, um, sort of as long as you're you're painting. Um, that sort of that's very the nice. important thing. Um, but I mean, I think very in a similar sort of manner to you, like. If I if I could make all of my money from painting from the actual painting side of it instead of the selling of paintings, right. I would be a very happy person. Oh, like yeah. I love painting. Like painting is always the thing. Um, the selling of the paintings is sort of secondary because right. it's sort of you have to um, to survive. But right. like it's definitely not the sort of main goal. Um, it's just to paint. Um, and I really like artists that have that same sort of mentality where it's like, yep, it doesn't, we'll do it on whatever, it, whatever crap surface we can put our hands to, um, and just make it work. Uh, because it's, it's such a privilege to be painting. It's like such a lovely sort of way to spend your time and sort of, uh, dedicate your sort of mental energy to, um, so it's it's definitely one of those things. It's like, yeah, this is very fortunate sort of person um, to be able to do this. But you know, sort of the the whole selling thing of it does. Sort oh, of... that's a that's a. I always thought that that was a different. Like, I think in my brain it occupies like a different space. If I have to yeah. be honest with you, 
And I think, you know, part of me is that because I was um, sort of educated as an illustrator, that was a very obvious thing that you had to hear, like people telling you, okay, we're going to make a portfolio and your portfolio has to be effective in the sense that it's going to give, you know, an idea of what you want your work to be about. Like if you want to get hired, you want to tell people, this is the sort of work that I can do. You know, this is the sort of work that I'm good at. This is the sort of work that I want to get, you know, paid from like this, this is, this is what I can do. And, um, it was always, I think SVA was, um, fantastic at the time because, uh, it, it was a, a sort of a prerequisite for them, for the teachers to also be working professionals. Um, yeah. So every single painter that you would meet, they would be showing at some gallery. Every single illustrator that was your teacher would be able to tell you, yeah, I did this poster uh, last month, or I did, I'm working on this children's book, or um, I'm doing these uh, paperback covers. So it was always you know, something that you could see reflected uh, on, you know, a, a particular market that, you know, you wanted to, depending on, on what you want to um, to specialize on, uh, um, you know, you could see somebody that was a working professional do it in front of you. And, yeah. and so I think that it was, it was always okay for me to think that making, you know, the, the part of selling what you're doing was the the sort of it wasn't the goal but it was just part of that equation it it just yeah. it just had to be for me to make a living it just it just had to be there there was no other way of thinking about it it was almost like um i don't know i i i think i saw myself as as like i i guess illustrators would would see themselves you know probably mid 20th century that it was like a job and it was like a job that most yeah. people could do. Like if you just go to art school and you just learn how to draw and then you can draw ads for magazines and you, you're the guy that draws cars or you're the girl that draws products or whatever, yeah. it, but it was like a job. And I always kind of felt that it was liberating to see it as a job. And then, and then, you know, you could deal with it as a job, like in the same way you go to, I don't know, to, to like, uh, if, if you're having like a job interview, you know, you speak about what you want your salary to be and, and you speak, you know, what your conditions, uh, your work conditions are going to be. And, and I think most people that go through jobs, you know, we all understand that that's like, yeah, sure. That's the part of getting a job. And I yeah. don't know why it's, uh, it's sort of demonized in art. In art, it just feels like that part of, of the commerce of art seems like, oh, you know, fuck this, like this, we don't want to talk about this. This is like complicated. It's, it's, I mean, the fact that it's not regulated just makes it super opaque and, and, and unclear because you have no idea what you should charge for something. When you ask other people, there's a ton of artists, you know, to, to the art world that would lie. It's like, dude, have you sold this? And they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I've sold the last 10 paintings that I've done and they sold for, you know, X amount of money and maybe they're lying. And and maybe yeah. they just don't want to admit that they haven't sold paintings. So it's one of those things that becomes like socially becomes super awkward and um, where it's it's very hard to find like, no, the, you know, these are the prices that I sell for. And I've sold 40 percent of the paintings that I did this year. You know, numbers yeah. that are like you want to hear those numbers like you, what you don't want to hear is somebody say, oh, you know, every single thing that I've painted i'm i'm you know i have it in my studio because i haven't sold anything because that who you know if you hear that then nobody like if you hear that you just don't want to do that like who would want to do that job if if all you hear is like oh no i don't sell anything nothing it, if you yeah. want to like my idea always was i want to live off of making paintings i do like that's yeah. that's my life like i'm gonna do have, do whatever I can so that I can live off of making paintings. So if I had surrounded myself with just that, like the the echoing of that, like, oh no, you have to find something else because look, my studio is full of paintings. That would have crushed me. That would have completely defeated me. But I also never liked a person that said, I oh, 
did you sell everything? Yeah, I sold everything. It's like, what? Mm. How do you do that? Like, how the fuck do you do that? Like, what do you, how can you nonchalantly just say, I sold everything? So it was really weird for me because I, I remember when I was, you know, like out of school and trying to figure that out, I would meet those two extremes. I would meet like fellow artists that like me, we were like, oh, dude, it's impossible to find a gallery. Like our jo our paintings are not good enough. Um, we could clearly see that. So we were not ready for that. And then you would see more accomplished artists that you would go to their shows and like 85% of a show is sold out. Or I would yeah. go to like a Skip Lipke show and 100% of his show was sold out. And I would be like, what the fuck? Like, how do, how do people do this? Like, what is this? Like, how is there like such an enormous precipice between where I'm at and where seemingly success is like in that yeah. other shore where just everything that people do is like sold. And I thought that that was strange. That was very, very weird to, to like, you know, see myself as somebody that was just so inexperienced, so, you know, green that, um, that I just, that the art world didn't seem like it was a place for, for people like me. And, um, but eventually eventually you start noticing that it's like, Hey, if you want to sell something, you have to sell it. Like you have yeah. to, you have to, you can't just be, it's a difference between like people that treat Instagram. They want to treat it as a storefront, but they just like put images on their Instagram and it's like, Hey, these are for sale. Like DM me. It's yeah. like that. I always, I've always felt, and I, I I'll say this like super honestly, I've always felt that it, that's like, you know, that's a little bit, it sounds like, hey, these are good. Throw money at my face. And they yeah. could be really good, but it doesn't mean people are going to throw money at your face. Like, that's not how it works. I, if it were, I mean, if you're that good and that just people like throw money at you, great. Like, that's awesome. But that's not how it works for most of us. Like, most of us yeah. have to work, have to like find out how the hell do we create from people that, you know, you have worked and to, to like, you know, kind of create this community and harbor this community and take care of this community. How the hell do I find within this community people that can be willing to support what I do? How the yeah. hell do you not have a community to turn it into a market? Because I think that that's also kind of, you know, that sucks that, you know, to only see people as potential market it's betray it sounds like something that betrays the whole nature of wanting to build a community so i i don't think that that's the way either um but it's it's like how do i take care of this community enough so that people can start to consider the idea of like investing in art you know buying the buying whatever i do so how do i do that how do i take care of all these things to give myself the best chance so when i say hey this painting is up for sale you are literally giving your like giving yourself you're putting yourself at a place where you're giving yourself the best chance to do that but the sad thing is is that that is not that has nothing to do with painting so yeah you know you could be i i know painters that can paint circles around me and that don't sell anything so you know and i know enough of them to understand that the art world is fucking like unfair and the world is horrible but that's how, you know, that's a reality. It is. It just yeah. simply is. I wish the world was fair. And I wish that whomever was great at doing what they did and super inspiring that the world would, you know, reward them. But that's not the way it goes, sadly. So it's, yeah, go ahead, Tony. You're very, it's so uh, sort of true. Um, and it sort of, it is one of those difficult sort of, uh, things to have to come to realization with um, when it comes to sort of selling work as well. But like it, um, it's one of those, uh, you sort of talk about it being a job. Like I totally see Instagram as a job as well. Like I love DMing people and stuff and sort of just having stupid chats and all of that on Instagram. But like a lot of it is also like, okay, like let's try and keep this organized. Let's try and do this professionally so it's easy to read and sort of um it's not just something that I sort of throw things up without sort of 
thought for um and it's one of those aspects that like a lot of people don't want to put any time into because it is um a lot of work it's a lot of time but it's like it's part of being an artist in this current century is sort of right. navigating that space as well um and sort of as you say it can allow you to um make money as an artist um it's a fantastic tool for that but it shouldn't be sort of that's not how you should be approaching your audience like you shouldn't be like hey i want your money um it's like no i want you to enjoy my paintings um i i think that a, a lot of the people that we've uh, gotten paintings from um they're not even like attempting to to sell which i really appreciate that you know they're just concentrating on what they're doing but it's also you know our like in terms of of um of pushing people it's also my way you know it's it's I, i've met like a bunch of um of young artists this way where it's like a message saying like dude this work is so good like you can start to try to move your work because it is yeah. it like in the same way that i was completely attracted and drawn towards it and i am you know a thousand percent willing to tell you i want it and just tell me how much it is and i'll paypal you the money and it's it can be that simple like young artists have to realize okay it can be that simple but i need to you know i i don't like you don't want to just be discovered randomly like stumbled yeah. stumbled upon like that's great that makes for a great story but you, you know if you want to live off of what you're doing you you can't expect to be stumbled upon constantly so yeah. you you have to give yourself a chance you just have to um so yeah so i i often talk to people about like hey this is like this is awesome just you know put a i mean i had no idea how to do it i i fucking had to look at like a a couple of like youtube videos and how to set up a storefront I even had to fucking travel because we are in, in Colombia. I had to travel to get my bank account, like an American bank account set up so I could have PayPal because I can't have PayPal here. It's not right. set up. It's not set up for, for banks here in Colombia. So I had to travel to have a, you know, a, 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 an account set up um, so that I could link it um, so that I could have a storefront. Um, and all those things, ha all those things can be done. And we set everything up before knowing that we had sold like a single painting. Yeah. Everything was set up before, you know, and I've often spoken about this, but I, t I told Danny, like, we do this and it doesn't matter. Like, whatever happens, it doesn't matter. We keep going. Like, fuck yeah. it. If we, if we go through that first week, like that first week, it's going to be three years ago. If we go through that first week and we don't sell a single painting, like we did five videos, we don't sell anything, we keep going. And if we, yep. and if it's three weeks and we've done 15 videos and we haven't sold a single painting, we keep going. And I told her, and we keep fucking going like for those two years. It doesn't matter. Like we keep going. Well, we, we said we're going to do this. And that's what it means when you say you're going to do something. And, um, and that was a hundred percent our mindset. Like, I, I know that maybe it sounds easier now that we did well, but it didn't matter. I could tell you right now that, dude, I was like a thousand percent ready to suck, to be, yeah. to fail miserably at it. Like my mind was ready. I was ready and I was stubborn. I was fucking proud and stubborn to say, if if this doesn't work, we go, we keep going. Because I had some money saved up that we could use as a as a like a a little cushion, and but I always thought, fuck it, if if it's if you know if that money is, starts to run out, like I I get a job, I, I'll go back to teaching or I'll do something else or I'll try to sell yeah. a bigger painting. I don't I don't know. Like I told myself, I don't know. Cross that bridge when we get there. I don't know. But right now, it was for me. It was like super important to say, I am a thousand percent in. Like. It doesn't matter what happens. And I do think that you kind of have to have that, that um, you know, risk it all um, sort of mentality 
because it gets you in the right mindset where you just fight, like you claw yourself out of a problem. And I do think that artists need to be that way because yeah. we are, we are, first of all, I think we are traditionally like super fragile. Like our ego can be like easily bruised and, and we could be de devastated when we have a show and we don't sell anything or we don't get like uh, good criticism on what we do. I think that that's natural for us. That's like the natural state for us because we're so invested in what we do yeah. that, that we become uh, like that vulnerability just really sort of um, it's necessary, but I think it also softens up and it softens us in some degree. And I think it's okay. But that's why you have to be ready. You you just have to be. And I, I do think that in those bigger kind of risk reward settings, there is no way to go. Like I make it sound, I, I hope when people hear this, like they don't feel like I'm making it sound like, yeah, it's a project. Yeah. And I was going for it. It's like, no, I have like fucking two kids. It's like, yeah, I had, I have to look out for my two kids for everything that they need. So this is not like, yeah, this is a project. This is like, yeah, I don't know where my kids are going to get food or like, you know, we have to pay uh, for school here or who's going to pay for the school. It's, you know, it, it's that it's like, you're literally saying I'm betting all like everything that I know I'm betting it all on this. And I don't know. I've, I've always felt that that's, you know, that's a, it's it's a very scary it's a very very scary place to be but it it also in a way it clears a lot of things up it just yeah. makes it like super simple super super simple it's like you know instead of like worrying about a thousand things you're like fuck it let's make this thing work and you don't want to tell yourself that you're trying to make it work because everything else depends on that one little thing but but you understand it to be true. You realize like, oh shit, like I, everything else really does depend on this thing. So I don't know. For, for me, those moments, the moments I think where I'm most scared of, it, they also provide me with the most clarity and I like it. I actually like it. I'm horrified. Don't get me wrong. This is not like I'm a fucking psycho and it's like, let's risk the future of my children every time I make a decision. It's like, no, no, no. Like that's, there's a there's a small sense of irresponsibility also in there but it also puts you in in the in the right mindset that says okay you believe in this like yeah work your fucking heart out when you're gonna do this like really work towards this and i do think that that's something that we need I, like we need to hear it we need to understand it and we need to be totally up for it if if there are like um like safety nets around us constantly, I do feel that, yeah, it's comfortable to make art. Sure. And that's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. But um, I do think that the, 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 the sort of constant alertness that you get when things are really, really important, when you can sense the weight, that like the real weight of things, I think that like that brings something out of you that it's like you can't bring that out when you feel safe. You can't bring, yeah. you know, those things out when you feel safe. So, um, yeah. I mean, I I was talking to my my partner, um, Imogen, um, like maybe two weeks ago or something. Um, and we've been we've been together this year. We've been together for ten years. Oh, um, look at that! Congrats. So, um, and I just sort of spoke to her and was like. I think the rest of my life is going to be trying to contribute to the conversation of painting. Um, and she was like, yeah, of course, duh. Like, of course that's going to be the case. Um, but it very much was just like, oh no, this is something I need to say and sort of think for myself in terms of like, this is the mindset that I need to be in, in order to like, experiment with paint enough do enough sort of like paintings and sort of be in that space enough that you can sort of contribute because i mean i was i've talked about it to a, a few friends sort of recently um and i think that painting in sort of the the modernity of it is 
on the precipice of becoming sort of a discussion again, sort of a mainstream discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, and like we have things like uh, there's obviously programs like Sky Portrait that help that sort of put that into the public eye a bit. Um, social media sort of is a big thing of that. Like um, sort of say what you want about Devon's work, Devon Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like he is really sort of bringing figurative work to a very very large audience and making it sort of um in the limelight again and i thought i do think that it's making people regard painting differently um and there's no way that i don't want to be part of that conversation like it's just i have to be um and that means that yeah you've got to work very that's not an easy thing to want um it's not a quick thing to want it's not going to be easy or whatever but like i do think it's worth it um and it's uh it's also helpful to sort of surround yourself with people who also uh thinking that sort of all sort of all want to have share that same sort of vision within um your sort of mentality of it all right you know, I'm the, I'm the, uh, I'm usually, and I like to, I like this role. I, I like to be devil's advocate in this conversation also. Cause y- y- you have like the, the hopeful side of, um, of painting. And it's not that I, I have the, the, uh, dystopic side of, of, of the, uh, of the conversation of, of the possible future. But, um, I just think, I just think that painting is going to change like dramatically, yes. like yes. drastically going to change. So that's what kind of excites me that this definition of painting is probably the one that's up for grabs. Um, you know, th- what we do and what most people do today, I would, I would venture to say that what probably the vast majority of painters around the world do, it's still quite a very classical de- definition of painting. It's just, it's still paint that comes in a tube or in a jar and you still have some sort of brushes or other tools that you apply it to a substrate and, and, and that's it, you know, that's it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pigment that's spread, you know, with whatever binding, you know, agent onto whatever, you know, substrate whatever substrate yeah. that, that kind of um, abstractly symbolizes like a two dimensional plane. But that's, uh, you know, that's about it. That's, that's what we've done for centuries. And we kind of still do that. Um, but, but what I was saying, you know, about image making and, and painting, just um, be having been the, like the queen of, of, of image making for so many centuries and now suddenly, I don't know. I don't know if it can compete. I mean, it's not a competition, but, but in in at some point, painting was like held the responsibility of solely telling people what things look like. You know, it yeah. was like the the most powerful propaganda tool in the world. Like painting could show you hell. It could show you heaven. It could show you salvation, damnation. Uh, it could show you what your country could look like if you go through a war. It could show you your country's values that you wanted to uphold. Like painting was the most powerful, you know, visual um, tool that existed. I don't think that's the case anymore. I really don't. No, okay. Not even close. Not even close. Um, we are at a point that people don't even trust images. Like when I see yeah. ads, ads for anything like, oh, look, I'm bald. And if I use this cream, look, it made my hair grow. <laughs> and it's like, dude, that's Photoshop. Come on. Like I don't care about images anymore i don't trust images i don't care about them um with deep fake stuff you know we're gonna get to a point where somebody's talking and your your brain is gonna be like really are they really talking is that really yeah. them it's probably not them and, and we are getting that close we're probably a, a few decades away from from completely mistrusting everything everything that is like inherent to image making um and i think that that's when things are gonna just kind of beautifully fall apart where I don't know. I don't know what it means to make a painting anymore. Certainly nothing even remotely close to what it meant. So I I would love to, I'm probably going to be dead. 
I, I mean, I wish I, I hope I don't. I hope, well, I don't want to go to grand grandfather Galinsky, uh, um, you know, age. I think that that's, uh, that's a little too well, far for me. He, he was, he was doing some work. Um, oh no, dude, so... but 97, it's too much. I want to die like in my seventies, like, you know, mid seventies. I think that's, that's as far as I want to go. Uh, that's, like, <laughs> that's a good ride for me. That's when I jump into a volcano. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's good for me. If I didn't do it, you know, if I didn't learn anything in life when, uh, you know, when I'm 76, 77, um, then I don't know, you know, call it quits. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I have an idea of life and I think that, I don't know if it goes too long for, for too long. I don't, I, I don't know if I like that too much, but, um, I, I get what you mean but i hope i hope i can um i hope i can be alive to see all this like reconfiguring going on like people just you know frying their brains trying to you know figure out how the hell do we you know understand this now i fucking would love that i would really really love that it's it's so exciting as a prospect and it's also sort of you are very right. We're sort of getting closer to that than we've sort of ever been. And sort of, we will only continue to get closer to it. Um, so it only becomes more of a possibility uh, that sort of is for some artists to then take on and, and uh, sort of solve. But it's, I sort of feel that there's been elements of sort of re-engaging with what painting is and what painting means through sort of social media and sort mm -hmm. of like how that has forced us to interact with paintings and sort of how you can navigate that space um, in order to sort of give people a, a sort of experience of mm -hmm. your work. Um, and I think that that's really interesting to sort of look at now um, and sort of see how artists are exploring that like yourself with the YouTube channel that's, uh, and and your Instagram as well. That's like a very uh, like sort of new um, way of painting or painters to be engaging um, that hasn't been sort of offered to the vast majority of painters throughout history. So it's like, okay, what what do we need to do to sort of use this in order to sort of communicate? Sort of, um, and that's definitely sort of been very interesting to see sort of start to happen i think people are sort of thinking that that might be more of the case than it was maybe 10 years ago or whatever but right oh, um, oh for sure maybe you know if you even go back 40 years ago like paint what painting was in 80s or how painting was understood in the 80s there were arguments that painting had died painting was dead yep. you know so or, or like the death of painting um so yeah this is i mean not proven to be like um I, I don't think art needs to prove anything it's not like let's fight for this to show people that we are resilient or we are no come on yeah. it's, it's painting it, it of course it's something incredibly powerful it's just that i i i don't think i think i just think we're going to understand things differently that's I, i've always yeah. felt that that's that's going to be my point. And maybe, and that's what's kind of scary. Maybe it also means that we don't paint the way we used to paint. Like that's the yeah. thing. May, like we have to be open to the, you know, possibility of, of redefining painting at such level that it doesn't involve the making of paintings. I, I have no idea what that even looks like or how, what that even like entails, because I don't know if, you know, from our shore right now we're capable of understanding what the needs of yeah. you know a society that that struggles to um redefine like visual imagery like what is that gonna do to society what is that what is that gonna feel like um but i think we're getting there i don't know it's it's probably gonna be you know exciting for art i think that at times we just have to go and, and look beyond even as painters, we have to look beyond painting and understand that art is bigger than painting. Like yeah. the, 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 the push for art is, is bigger than all of us. 
And um, and I don't know. I think that that's again. I I would I'm the sort of person that I would love to um, love to be alive for that, or at least like um, I've said this, like a floating brain in a jar. Yeah. You know, and just uh, connect me to some cameras, and and I can just watch it all uh, very happily. It's it's so interesting as well about that sort of like. I'll tell Hearst. That. I'll say I'll tell Damien yeah. Hearst to make me into a, an exhibit, like a, you know, put me in a tank, put my brain, like my sentient brain, in a tank, uh, Hearst, and you could call it art. I don't care. I just want to be alive. <laughs> I just want to be alive for, uh, for all of it. Now it's it's one of those things that sometimes I really sort of uh, look upon artists like like Max Gins Ginsburg and uh, Richard Schmidt and sort of painters of of that generation yeah who were really sort of going at it raw people were really over painting um and they were still just painting because they loved painting yeah um and it wasn't like a cool sexy thing to do or anything no. but they still just did it um and sometimes it's like oh yeah uh, i'm very thankful to those those painters who sort of did stick it through and were still sort of furthering the conversation of painting because it definitely wasn't uh the main way of sort of engaging with art for a lot of people oh imagine painting and like deciding to paint figurative painting in the 60s and 70s like yeah that's crazy <laughs> that is like i want to be unemployed uh, yeah exactly it's, yeah it, it, and not only unemployed it was like people were offended by your painting like they thought that that was like the lowest form of art uh, yeah, yeah. Those those people, are, Antonio Lopez, they're they're in many ways like heroes. You know, they they champion things that are so fundamental to to most of us. I'm not going to say all of us, but most of us that love painting. But they and they did it at a time where you know it just nothing made sense for them. Nothing doing something like that made no sense. I mean, they they could have had a million excuses to not do it. They could have yeah. convinced themselves of how stupid it was to do something like that, and they painted regardless. So and they, I, they I've always said, that. like, you paint in spite of. I, I've always yeah. felt that painting is that you you paint in spite of. I I think throughout history, even when painting was powerful, even when painting was respected. There's always this feeling of you paint in spite of, like that. That there's a push to paint, even in ways that you knew that people wouldn't um, approve of or appreciate. Or it, it's it's always been like that. The drive of painting has always been that. Um, so I've always loved it for that. It's like if if in the best of the circumstances it didn't make sense, it just it it feels like it's not meant to make sense. It feels like yeah. It's okay for it to be, you know, this kind of aimless thing that you just push. Um, I I kind of like that. There is um, futility to it that is very attractive to me. I think in a in a very effective world, um, where every choice has to be thought out, where every consequence has to be measured, where um, how many people are affected by your decisions, you know, if it's, if it's your own, you know, um, life, if it's your children's, if it's your partner's, um, to do something that is, seems completely irrational. It's like, I'm just going to try to abstract a bag of grapes and, yeah. uh, and, uh, that's but it. Cause it's, I don't know. I want to lose myself while talking uh, thinking of how the hell I can, you know, think of a bag of grapes. Um, it, then that's it. It's one of those. It's one of those elements, though, that like I definitely very very recently have sort of engaged with some paintings as like there isn't a huge sort of overarching narrative to this painting. The draw of this painting is that like it is so beautifully observed. This is someone spending so much time sort of understanding something or like abstracting something um, and really sort of 
just showcasing this really wonderful sort of aspect of thought. Um, and uh, there's a there's a YouTube channel that I really like that sort of is doing that, but for like CGI. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just love the fact that they're like thinking about these things so complexly. It's like, yep, that's exactly the sort of thing that I sort of enjoy um, and sort of want to do sometimes. And it's fine for paintings to be that, like to just be, look how I'm observing this and sort of translating this so that you can sort of see a different aspect of it. Yeah. Um, is the channel Sometimes is the that's... channel the one of the uh, the guys that did the uh, Luke? So the, the ones that uh, no, it's um it's called Corridor Crew. I think um, so. Yeah, they're the ones that yeah. watch like old CGI and try to figure out how yes. they did it. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. They actually uh, hired the after the the Luke that was at the end of um of uh, Mandalorian. They yeah. they try to make it a little bit better. They try to like do that deep fake a little bit better. Yeah. And the guy actually ended up working for uh for Disney. Uh right. so the second version of Luke that is far far better. I mean it's still one of the weirdest hardest things to do to try to like fake a real human being. Uh like yeah. the, a younger version of a real human being. Um. Yeah, that was that was the guy that did that. But yeah, I love that. I love the uh, Terminator Two T Two that they were doing. Yeah. They were trying to figure out like like almost um, uh, reverse engineer like how those the like how those shots of um, of him going through the uh, the jail cell, uh, you know how they worked, how they did that, and it's incredible because they were like, holy shit, this movie's like over twenty years old. It's like probably 30, yeah. maybe. I don't know. I remember. But, um, uh, and they were able to do something better with the tools that they had than us trying to figure it out with our tools. And, and they just, they kind of realized that the tools that they had back then were just really good and almost like crafted so that they could work for those things as opposed to the tools that, that even though are far more advanced, obviously. They, that people have right now but yeah it's a i love that channel too it's it's super super cool it, i'm i'm just like remember watching when they were talking about like blade runner yeah um, and the original blade runner and oh, obviously crazy. like everybody um seemingly blade runner is hugely influential as a movie because it is just so aesthetically stunning oh yeah um, it's uh, yeah that, that 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 movie makes no sense in this world That's, no exactly it's, it's um, crazy absolutely crazy um and they talked about this how in um the second blade runner where they have the young version of the um sort of like robot lady from the first one mm-hmm. um and essentially they just remade some scenes from the movie mm. with uh like their version of it to just prove that it could be done um and i was like yep this is this is exactly the sort of thing that i like just like yep look how we have developed this to the point in which we can make it this convincing um and it's just really exciting to sort of see that um in a lot of circumstances right. uh but when they talk about how the original blade runner was was made and shot it's just one of those things it's like oh it's a shame that sort of people don't do this in the same way anymore right because it looked great then oh yeah um and sort of still looks great it's like what like the first scene where it's got the overhead sort of like pan of the city that's amazing Um, and that was just on film and they just reset the film like 18 times to get different exposures for all the different like lights that are happening um so it's like a huge amount of work to get that one shot right but that shot looks amazing so it's like it's totally worth it um and i'm sort of coming to terms with that in in painting a lot at the moment that's like sometimes it's a lot of work to get like an effect right um and like sometimes those effects are what will like make uh like an aspect of light um sort of read correctly um and it's totally worth it to put all that effort in. It's totally worth it to sharpen your pencil 
every two minutes if you need a really sharp pencil point. It's l- laborious, but if it gets you sort of that look, then of course you've got to do it. Uh, right. right. And it's, it's again, it's not, it goes ag- against the, uh, the grain that has been, you know, set in, in a lot of industries and even in our own world and in, in our own like art world that it's about efficiency. But yeah. um, I have my, like, you know, I, I, I often wonder um, uh, when I think about uh, Antonio Lopez. Yeah. Like I, I see him as a painter and, and I think he's a very, like his paintings and particularly when he shows you how he starts a painting, they're very simple to understand. They're very Spanish in that sense. Like they are, they almost bear it all. Like, you know, his way of painting is just um, a lot of very disciplined, you know, kind of grayish mixing, but it's very simple. It's little simple blotches of color. It's very, very simple. Sometimes, it, you know, it's not about like doing like this gorgeous brushstroke. Sometimes the brushstrokes are like, um, like Peter Brown, you know, style of brushstrokes. They're kind of broken. You know, they don't have to be yeah. like absolutely spot on perfect. Like the drawing doesn't have to be like the straight lines or like perfect. Um, like your hand, it doesn't have to be super, super steady. Um, no, it's just, it's, it's a very regular sort of painting. But you know, one thing that would um, drive me insane is that as a human being, I always thought of this. It's like when you you would hear about uh, Gran Villa, that painting, and it's like, oh no, and he would spend years going back to that spot painting this. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I could, I guess I could do that, but what do I, like, how do I live in between wanting to go back to that, yeah. port, like, you know, like that intersection to paint? Like, how does one just live? How does one just say, you know what? I'm, you know, I want to go to this place and and paint for either 25 minutes or two hours. You know, how, however light decides that I should paint, however long light yeah. decides that I should paint. I, I, I remember I struggled with that when I was younger and I still kind of do because I, there is such a, like lack of again, lack of efficiency in everything, in in every every kind of in the d- DNA of that decision making. There's there's such a disregard for like life, for like living, yeah. that I it shocks me. It I'm just like how do how do you do that? And and maybe people could say, hey, great people just sacrifice a lot, and they are probably making sacrifices that you don't understand. But it, weirdly, that's not quite the case with Lopez. Lopez actually made quite some money because he started selling paintings to private, you know, that's why a lot of his paintings are not really in the public, like in public museums, right. because a lot of um, people bought them privately during the um, like 70s and 80s. And, you know, it's it's kind of, it's just weird. It's just It's just really like a strange... The strangest way to live, I feel. That's why I've always said, like, I don't know, maybe you could teach somebody to paint like that. And I think that if you if you dive deep into the impact that he has had for now decades um, in 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 Spanish, you know, figurative painting, particularly like plain air, you know, working from life painting, there's a lot of people that work closely under him that that, you know, you look at their work and it's like very, very Lopez inspired. Um so I think I do think you can paint like that, but I there is always there was always a side of me that that felt I'm just not built for that. I'm not the human being yeah. to do these things. Like even if I had that ability, I wouldn't be the human being that stares at like this fruit in a tree and just wants to endlessly draw it. Like I don't I I don't do that. I don't do those things. I'm not like I said, I'm not built like that. I I, n- I never was, and I don't think those are the things that anyone can teach you. I think that's I think you're born with that. You have that personality, or you don't. It's that's what's part. I I think part of the um draw of uh Uglo, yeah, because he was sort of doing that, but sort of in a in a sort of at a better pace, I guess. 
um, or a sort of more efficient pace. But then he was also sort of like taking the piss out of it. Like he knew that it was all sort of a bit uh, sort of over, maybe over the top in, in some regards. The fact that like, okay, you're going to redraw this pair as it rots um, because you take so long on your drawing. Um, and I, I had a very sort of this, the art academy where I went to, we it sounds very similar to the um, uh, the place that you studied, that everyone is an artist, sort of like our admin, our receptionists, their re- their artists, um, sort of like their photographers and uh, like everybody is a painter. That certainly was the case um, when I started there. Um, now I don't know sort of all of the staff that I sort of only meet the ones that I teach with and stuff, but like um, it's uh, one of the things that we had the opportunity to sort of learn that sort of style of painting and like style of drawing, uh, sight size sort of drawing and really baroque sort of really lengthy processes. Um, and the first session with a fantastic artist called Giles Lester, like fantastic um, painter and sculptor, um, you draw the outline of a uh, like a bell pepper mm-hmm. that's been painted white for eight hours um, because we used to be there 10 till five. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, we, I did that that day and I was like, this is just not, I will never use this sort of thing. This just isn't for me. I really appreciate the skill that it takes, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that I want to sort of do it um, type thing. Uh, and it's it's part of the case like if you can identify that um then maybe you can sort of like skip aspects of drawing and painting that like don't aren't relevant to you in order to sort of get you where you need to go um to start painting sort of as you want to be painting right and then you can sort of start looking back at that um post humorously sort of once you've got a bit of time or a bit of experience under your belt because then you engage with things differently. You don't have to like struggle with drawing because you probably know how to draw um, or sort of you have enough of an understanding to sort of tackle these situations, which maybe aren't as imp- appealing to you, but you sort of understand that if you do, you might sort of improve your observational skills from life or whatever. Um, it's easier to go into that space sort of with some form of, uh understanding beforehand i guess but yeah it is a very it's a very dedicated sort of person to to spend that amount of time um working on on work like that um oh, i it was never going to be me i i i respect the people that do that enormously enormously but i also realized that no i was I know that I'm not, you know, on this earth to uh to do that stuff like that. Like that's not my purpose, I'm sure. Now, we've sort of we've sort of talked about like some some past artists. Like are there any artists that you're sort of seeing work off now that sort of is really just blowing you away sort of um let me think. I mean, the, the answer is obviously yes. I can't imagine saying no to that. That would be absurd. Um, but I, I'm trying to think of... Oh, you know who I saw just recently? And I, I actually um, DM'd him, and, and he was very nice. Um, I, I've always been blown away by, by Peter Brown and doing you know what he does. Uh, with, that's, uh, that's Pete the Street, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Pete the Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think he's has to be one of the best uh, plein air painters, yeah, particularly like he's, urban he's painters. But he can paint anything um, today. But um, I recently saw Rob Poynton painting that he. Um, I forget exactly what he did. He was doing like um, let me like a residency, but right. But um, I I mean when I look at. Uh, at Peter Brown's work, it just, it, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. It's, it's, uh, it's yeah. beyond my grasp even, but as a painter, I can, 
I can see what he's doing and I can see like, okay, these are decisions that even I like, I, I'm, I'm not at all good as a, as a plain air painter, but I've gone through the feelings that you go through when you, when you, um, when you try to dissect and observe how, how, uh, uh, plain air painting is painted, you, you can kind of, if you've done enough, and I think I've done enough plain air painting to, to sort of dissect, be able to dissect it and understand it. Um, you know, which only makes me, makes the the end product to just something that's that's you know it blows me away at a, to to a degree that's like oof, because you kind of you kind of know how you know what the struggle of going and trying to chase light feels like or yes yeah, you know yeah, exactly. ca cars running by people people going by walking by like the choices that you make of which people are are staying still or maybe nobody's staying still and i just my job is to recognize like the sort of repetition of shapes and 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 give it some sense but you can identify those things even for, again for somebody like me who do doesn't do it justice like i can see those things um but when i was looking at uh, uh pointon's uh painting at rob pointon's painting i don't know if i i i'm like i don't know how you're doing this i i really don't yeah. Um, I, and I, I still don't know how he's doing that from life. I, I really, really don't. I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you, the only good answer that you could give is that they are extraordinary painters and that's it. They're extraordinary at what they do. Um, yeah. which is kind of like a non-answer because it just, you know, you, you can't rationally explain how people can do those things. But, um, I wrote to him and I, I told him that, um, it really reminded me, and I had never seen in any painter. I mean, this is the way I see things, but it doesn't mean anything. But, but uh, it it I had never seen a painter, um, not even in Spain actually, doing something that holds like the DNA of like uh, Ramon Casas. And Ramon Casas has to be like a lot of people when they say like you know late uh, 19th century, early 20th uh, painting, they always say Soroya, Sorn, Sargent. And that's like your holy yeah. trinity. And they're amazing. And, and nobody, like, who's going to question that? They're incredible. You know, that's just, you know, it's it's uh, one of those, like, very simple truths. It's, it's not even, like, something that, that people can debate. If you want to debate who's better, it's like, yeah, sure, we can, you know, grab yeah. a pint and, like, try to think who's better but it doesn't matter it doesn't really matter like who whoever comes up on top it's like yeah they're all amazing who cares yeah um but usually people don't think about ramon casas and ramon casas has to be there it has he has to be he's a little bit different so he's not um you know he didn't do as much work i would say as um as all three of them um probably sergeant was the most prolific i guess and then Soroya maybe and then uh, Zorn and I would say um I would say Ramon Casas is probably the the one that least the, the that did the least of, amount of paintings but but for example he has like a bunch of paintings that that have crowds in it like these yeah like an enormous sense of a crowd in it that is like nothing that I've ever seen before it's it's just I don't know I don't know like the the complexity of trying to understand a thing that is made of entities of like individual entities trying to to understand the the groupness of it the 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 sort of cumulus quality of it yeah I, that is like one of the strangest and and like just most wonderful problems to be solved in in like painting ever i feel it is it's beautiful and and historically what we've, we've done is like oh shit this crowd is made of a thousand people historically artists would be like oh fuck here we go a thousand little heads like i have to draw a thousand little people here and have to give them like a little face and and that's how people would do it they would just paint everything and draw everything it was crazy um but eventually we realized no that's insane that is insane yeah. like it's fine that we can do it, but it's insane. There has to be a better way to communicate, um, you know, uh, the the complexity of of understanding that 
what we see as I don't know, let's say pasture or um, or a foliage uh, or hair or a crowd, there is a singularity to them, to all of them. There is it. We don't think of of foliage as thousands of individual leaves. We see like the tree shape. We we understand yeah. that foliage constitutes like you know the top of a tree. Um, and it's the same thing with hair. It's the same thing with, you know, a field of grass. Um, it's the same thing with a crowd. We we realize that there's thousands of people down there, you know, if we're looking from above, but we can't identify the, the human, like the human being, like each human being in there. We sort of identify what happens when all of them are like mushed together. And um, I mean, it sounds like such a, I don't know. It sounds like, okay, sure. Yeah, that's an issue. That's a problem. But it's like, it's not. It's like fascinating. It's it's one of those things that it's like, no, this is like proper mind bending. It's it's not easy to do this. Yeah. Um, and I think Ramon Casas is like, probably with Goja, it's probably like the best at doing that. I, I really don't think anyone comes even close to that, to those two, not even close. And I don't think that, I do think that Ramon Casas like grows from Goya and because the Spanish sort of history of painting is so kind of tightly knit together that you kind of, you tend to see those things. You tend to see painters just like feeding off of their own history in a beautiful way. Um, yeah. But um but Rob Poynton is the first painter that I've seen. I I like devour images. I I am an idiot when it comes to like fucking consuming images. I love images. I fucking adore images. And I don't have like a good brain for a lot of things, but I fucking my brain holds paintings like, you know, you know, it's the best thing that I can do, I feel. And yeah. I can't think of anyone that does things like he was doing in this residency it is it's just not i don't know i don't i can't rationally explain it you know and he's painting you know from a window like a closed window at looking at like you know a bunch of people on horse like all these guards on horseback like you know and 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 um the queen's sort of carriage with uh it, it's coming you know cuz this he he was doing his residency when the queen passed so he actually yeah. did a bunch of paintings of that. I have no idea. Like when I started really looking at his paintings, I was like, oh, fuck you. Like, are you kidding yeah. me? This is just, it's, it's what you want to see in a painting where it's, it's that little bit of disbelief that you go like, I don't like, you could have given me like pictures, like photographs and everything. And I would do a painting, but it's, like what he has in those paintings, it's like, forget it. Like I, yeah. I struggle to think of many people right now painting in this world. I mean, for sure, we don't know everyone that's painting in this world, but let's say of all the socialized images that, that, that are out there, uh, I, I don't know of anyone that could have done what he was doing. I really don't. I think it's that, I mean, profoundly good you know, his painting. So that blew me away and I didn't expect to blow me away. I'm always very humbled when, when I see plein air painters because, you know, it's, it's something that I I'm horrified of and, and, you know, I'm, I'm sort of overwhelmed by, and I've always have, I always have this just feeling of, of just saying, you know, kind of like, you know, taking a knee and like yeah, saying like, I, I just don't know how to do this. You're amazing. Um, but when I when I saw uh, Poynton's work, I was like, "Oh, forget it! Like this is, it's beyond like this is good because I can't do this, you know, sort yeah. of attitude." It's not that. It's like this is just. I think it's like it's historically good painting. It, it's yeah. that sort of good painting. It's like, oh yeah, you could like put that in a museum right now, and it's it hold it'll hold it holds and it will hold for a thousand years. It doesn't matter. It's it's that sort of painting. It's it, it. He has, I don't know. He had that bit of like timeless, like timelessness to it that great painting has. Yeah. I feel that 
you know, that's why you could look at a Velasquez and, and just not feel like, oh, fuck, if I were in like, you know, 17th century Spain, I could get this. But, you know, from from this you know perspective, I can't. No, you don't need to like or if I was 17th century Dutch, like I could understand Rembrandt. It's like, no, you don't need to. You can. Of course, you can look at a Rembrandt. Yeah, I, I think his paintings are like timeless that way. It's it's really something else. So yeah, I, you know, th- there's a, a ton. Of, I could give you a thousand examples, but but for some reason that that one hit me. Oof, it hit me hard when I was, I, and I know he had a show just recently, like a couple of weeks ago, uh, for, with all these paintings, and and they are. I wish I could have seen that show. I think that was that was probably a, like a you know mind blowing show. Um, yeah. Who do you, who are you looking? Uh, well, it's funny. You, well, I almost, I was so very tempted because obviously Paris is, isn't too far from, from the UK and stuff. I was very, very tempted to go and see Sainer's show. Oh, um, yeah. That 10, <laughs> mi- that 10 meter painting. Yeah. Um, because painters don't do 10 meter paintings very often. No. Um, well, well, and, well, you, well, well, I mean, easel painters, let's say. Yeah, um, because there's a and, there's a generation of of you know facade painters, like urban painters that are fucking doing yeah. you know, just bi- oh, even no, bigger yeah. than that paintings. Um, it's we we have to it. kind of consider that he's probably the best at do you know doing those. But yeah, that, they're Zainer's incredible. Interaction was like really strange with me because I I discovered him when he was like. I don't know. He was like maybe 23 or he was quite young. Um, It was like back in like 2013 or something. And it was like back in the day when I used to use like Tumblr and um, Beyonce. Like, nice. Uh, Don't date um, yourself. Don't date yourself. Uh, yeah. And uh, I came across some of like Sainer's murals. And then I sort of was like watching him. And then it sort of all clicked and everything. He became like really, really popular when he was like 27. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah, 27 is the age to aim for. I was very off um, with that. I was like, okay, yeah, I have no idea what I'm doing at 27. Uh, and we were in lockdown as well. Um, so it's like, yep, yeah, that was a strange, strange time. But like seeing his work sort of uh, develop from these massive, massive murals to then like these really complex paintings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to tiny sketchbooks. Oh, I, uh, yeah, I, then, have, I have his sketchbook and it's it's gorgeous. Yeah. And then this ability, and he's probably one of the only very few artists um, that can do it, where he can sort of take his tiny, tiny sketchbooks and sort of the composition that he's doing in those and then scale it up to 10 meters. Right. Um, and right. that was exciting to see. It was like, oh, yeah, this is... Um, sort of different like you have a set of skills that sort of not many people have right um and you're doing something very sort of unique with it um yeah and again that's definitely just just clicks the right buttons in my head it's like yep this is cool i like this um i came across what i sort of had a big engagement with um sid's work like sidaya um sid the bully and yeah um yeah like her pastel work yeah um just completely blew me away yeah we have Uh, one we have one of hers yeah it's really good it's beautiful absolutely beautiful it it sort of just blindsided me as well um with this i had like only just maybe like a month or two months before tried out pastels yeah um and i was like First of all, this is super messy. I couldn't believe yeah. how messy it was. Um, and then second of all, like this is really difficult to get these sorts of like uh, descriptions because everything becomes very sort of soft or right. it has the possibility right. of becoming so soft. Right. Um, right. And yeah, just seeing her work, it was like, yep, this is a way that I would love to engage in this material yeah, but I don't think I need to because she's doing it so wonderfully. Oh, she does and... it beautifully. Yeah, she's a mess too. There's like a there's there's like a haphazard quality to it that is. I think that's the giveaway that that where she's just like perfectly suited for that. Um, yeah, for that 
sort of technique because um, it doesn't feel like she's pushing the technique. She's just very sort of embracing of the chalkiness yeah. of it. I mean, it sounds kind of redundant to say like a chalky pastel, but but there is like a like a like chalkiness, like a sort of dirty chalkiness to what she does. That it's so so nice. It just fits so perfectly what she does. That yeah. um, I just think it's a it's like this beautiful sign of when people connect the the what they are doing with the how they're doing it. It's just um, it, I don't know. It's 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 perfect, perfect. Yeah, she's a mess packing things and shipping them. So, yeah, but um, but we got we got the pastel and we're super happy I, with it. I got a painting from um Levisa. Oh, she's amazing. Uh, of course. Uh, ages ago. Um, uh, it was during, well, it must have been like 2019 or something, but it was, there was a Kenyo challenge where it was like you nominated two artists, you gave them an image to paint right. and take them on. And I, Jeannie had just painted, posted like Milo's Jeannie, yeah. um, had posted this image of her in a club from, her youth essentially she's like 20 or 25 or something um and i asked both lavissa and dan ferguson to paint it mm -hmm. um and lavissa's painting was just unbelievable um and immediately i was like i have to i have to buy this nice um sorry dan and, you suck <laughs> yeah sorry dan um, yeah. dan 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 does very well uh, i think with <laughs> I'm selling kidding. painting i'm so, kidding i'm uh, kidding um and uh i sort of asked him just like 100 euros and i was like no that's ridiculous yeah um yeah. Uh, but when she sent it to me she had used an entire roll of tape right um oh she's insane around. she's a psychopath yeah um and i, was I like i wanted to uh, call the police on on lovey because i was like yeah. i think this is something larger there's something larger here you know, I think she's harming like little animals. I think this is probably very telling of this absolute sociopath that is probably laughing like, you know, herself to sleep thinking of the what you have to go through to try to unpack her paintings. Yeah. It yeah. Was, it was quite the experience unpacking. Sociopath. Sure. I'm telling you. Uh, but yeah, it was it's such a lovely painting. Um, and I spent way, way too much on on paintings um it's like there are things that i definitely should be spending money on first um but it's just like nope um like you've gotta i've gotta have that um well that's what i like, show uh, my kids uh, no groceries but look at this painting yeah 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 sorry you have to we have to eat leftovers but let's do it in front of this new uh, little sculpture that we got yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's how we are. By the way, uh, Tommy, if you don't mind, I'm going to stop because I like it. So, no, so, yeah, that's absolutely fine. It's like a super um, simple, uh, super simple, but it's um, I don't know. I was trying to get to to whatever that meant, you know, just grapes in a little plastic bag. But there's like um, it exists in a place where it doesn't exist, and I kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, so I think that the more I do it. I, I was like um, risking just being like overly descriptive. And and right now, like all the decisions that I made, I like. Like every one of those decisions, I think it's easily sort of identifiable. You can kind of pick them with tweezers if you wanted to. And that's, I like that. I like that, that a painting can be super simple. Painting of something that's highly complex can, at least it's it's like Genesis can be super, super simple. So... So I want to it's, leave it like that. It's amazing sort of when we do describe things as sort of the simplest way. I'm like constantly, uh, cause at the moment I'm teaching quite a lot of life drawing. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I'm sort of constantly walking around and just saying like, you don't know how well this line is describing the three dimensionality or the twist of this like limb. Mm -hmm. Um, but like as you as someone who sort of has seen a lot of limbs this like described in paintings like this is fantastic and i just love this 
uh, globally lit sort of middle bit mm. where you've just got all of this light coming in through all the other grapes mm. and all of this like crazy reflected light to give you that sort of like inner glow of green. It's yeah. a very, very lovely uh, bit of painting. Oh, thank you. Thank you. How did you do? I have to like, yeah, turn, so like... that's nice. Uh, I mean, I don't, do I have my glasses? No, I don't have my glasses. Um, very nice. Nice pattern on uh, her dress. Am I guessing right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice yeah. hand gestures too. Beautiful. Like um, a bluish light. I've always thought that you were like, you're a sucker for like cooler lights. I, I feel. I, I, so without getting, cause it's like winding down and stuff, but without getting like too much into it. Um, I think that sort of there's this whole sort of like impressionism mm. 2.0 thing mm. going on with artificial light and artists sort of painting from phone screens and mm. sort of engaging with paintings on screens and stuff. It's like a new sort of time uh, to sort of a, gl a global way that painters are painting and sort of getting to the same results because right. everybody is painting from screens or everybody is painting and sort of then showcasing work on screens. For sure, yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely sort of artificial light is is huge in sort of that and sort of how it changes the, the sort of like mood of paintings. Nice. Um, Says the person that decided to take a, a Polaroid as reference. Yes, I know. Well, the thing is, yeah, they, um, they're fidgety. I know. Um, no, I love that. Like, I love yeah. that. I love that. I've always loved something that gives you enough, but like, I've always loved references that give you barely enough. Yeah. I always love that because when they give you all, what, like when everything is there, I always struggle to see what my role is in all of it. Like, I always feel like, okay, so then I just make this into a painting like i might as well yeah. just be like a save ass painting you know just be so be like a little bit of software and just make it make it look like painting and that's it um what? but but when there's little or when there's something that's i i used to think like when i um when i was a student i used to search like I, I, I always love to take photographs and I used to search for things that were paintable. In my brain, I would describe them as paintable. So I always, I always look like, obviously, at like light or like uh, conditions of light, but uh, yeah. and how specific lighting conditions could, you know, manifest in like shapes or atmospheres or, um, you know, it could be exterior, interior, it could be sunlight or it could be artificial light, it could be in the day or it could be at night. Um, but I always wanted to say, like, I was looking for something always. Like, I, I always thought great photos don't necessarily have to make for great paintings. Like, great photography does is not yeah. thinking like, like a photographer doesn't think like a painter thinks. Like, sure, in terms of like fundamental visual construction, like in terms of shapes, composition, like we there are many places where we meet, but but there is a moment where we just take we diverge and and we take separate roads. And um, and I always struggled because when I was younger, I used to feel like, oh, I I just need a great photo to paint from. Yeah. And um, and I would go out and you know take a bunch of photographs, and I would try to like say, oh, this is you know great, the sun is out, so I could channel my inner Soroja, and I could just try to like, you know, kill it doing these. Uh, you know, people love paintings of sunlight. So, um, eventually. I was having like this this um really dependent relationship with with uh with those sort of images and I didn't like the painter that I was like quickly becoming and yeah. um and even though like you know when I do workshops we work from life and even though I was somebody who was brought up working exclusively from life um even though I you know, I come from that and um, and I still do that when I have the opportunity to do uh, some teaching. Um, I mostly work from from photos, but nowadays I just don't, you know, I mean, I don't really care if a photo gives me a lot or very little or, you know, yeah. or, or, or I immediately consider like still my very kind of primitive brain thinks about it as, as something paintable. I just, you know, I always see it as as like, 
yeah, here comes like a new challenge to see what I could do with paint. Like turn like it's it's not it's not like uh turn this into a painting because it elevates it, because I don't think painting does that, to be honest. It's more of a let's let's see what happens when you try to translate th this into into a painting. Let's see what let's see what sort of decision making goes into trying to adjust all these like variables that are in here into something that can be a fun thing to paint, uh, like a painting yeah. exercise. Um, yeah, but, and now I just, I mean, for the longest time, I just, you know, and now I have, well, now for the last, I think four years or something, I've had the same phone, which has served me well. And then the camera is fine. But before that, the phone was fine also, like the, the older, smaller phone was fine. And, yeah. you know, it's never been like, oh, I need like a bigger phone or I need an iPad for this or I need, um, no, it's never been like that. It's always like, yeah, that's fine. But it, just... it was, it was so interesting because in one of the streams you sort of, you mentioned about painting with your phone yeah, uh, or like using your phone as a reference. And I was like, there's gotta be, there's gotta be a reason for that. Um, because I've never tried it. And like my studio set up, I had it. So I have like a nice, big monitor yeah. on yeah generally that i could see the reference on yeah um and i was like no i'll just try painting from from my phone uh and i only paint from my phone now the thing is that if i i prefer to have the painting that i'm painting on the big screen so i can see what it looks like at that sort of size nice um but i'd prefer to have the sort of information sort of on my phone because it's smaller it's sort of it's less sort of obvious with a lot of things but then you also have a different sort of interaction with it it's a lot more intimate because it's sort of small and close to you so it's not uh, something that's far away that you're trying to sort of yeah observe and, and and to be honest i i was um i was educated like it, it, that if you were going to do something you had to buy a roll of film and then shoot your photos and then, you know, have them printed or print them yourself, you know. Um, um, but I usually got prints that were like four by fives, I think. Yeah. Or is it three by? No, four by fives was like, like the regular size of photos, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But they're not, you know, they're photos about this size. And that was it. That was it. I always painted from photos about that size and I never blew them up. I never you know, asked for, um, enlargements or anything. Like I just, you know, that would, those were fine. And, um, you know, you couldn't pinch them and zoom them. <laughs> you couldn't do yeah. anything. You just had to look at them and, and say, okay, I guess, you know, I guess I'm, I like the, 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 the gaps that are there in terms of what I can or can't make out, I have to be filled with paint. Like that's where yeah. you show up. You have to make it work with paint. And I kind of always felt comfortable with that. I never felt the need to have anything other than that. I was never trained in sight size because I know a lot of people always print things in the size, like particularly portrait painters, they will print something in the in the exact size that they're going to paint it. Um, you know, if it's commissioned, they'll have like their printout right next to the painting. Yeah. And that's like, I totally get it, but I was, I was never educated with sight size. So I don't even, I don't even know how to think that way. Like my brain doesn't think that way. And that's probably why my drawing is horrible. Like my, my, my drawing is just full of, of, um, shortcomings. You, you know, it's like potholes of, you know, enormous sized potholes. But I also think that those shortcomings are kind of what makes my painting, my painting. So yeah, I, I don't know. I always kind of struggle and I say, oh, I, I, I have to be more disciplined. I have to draw better. But then I also realize like if I was drawing better, maybe a lot of the things that I love about my painting are kind of, they start to disappear. Like there's a, I don't know, there's, there's, there's something seductive about things that are just, you're not aiming for things to be wrong. It just, they just kind of happen to be off. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and it's, um, it's kind of beautiful when you let them be off. Cause I guess I could, I have every tool at my disposal to say, I'm going to measure the shit out of something until I get it right. Like there's nothing advanced about 
measuring things. It's just discipline. Yeah. It's just a necessary discipline to measure. Um, and, you know, I did that. I, I certainly did those things when I was starting out to paint and to draw. Um, and it's not that I don't have fond memories of that. I think it's, it, I think it's nice to um, learn how tools can be uh, when you encounter a problem, because all of art is just trying to solve problems. But when you encounter Definitely. a problem, you have tools that are, are meant to, you know, be your aid when trying to solve something and you can call upon them. You know, you can, you, if you have 10 of those tools, you can call upon 10 of them. Or if you have two, you can use those two, or maybe you can, you have them, but you can disregard them. Um, uh, I think I'm probably the person that has them. Certainly I don't have the ability like other people do. Like there's, there's for sure countless of other artists that draw better than me, paint better than me. Like they have, they're far more disciplined. Um, I'm, I am sure of it because I know how to see myself as a painter. So whenever I see painters that are doing things that I can't do, I, I very, very quickly contextualize myself within like you know, who I am as a painter. And I'm not yeah. validated by other people, but I, I know myself. Um, but there is something beautiful about not seeing the things that you can't do as flaws. Like there yeah. is, and I just, I don't know. I, I think that my painting is full of, of, you know, a myriad of those little things that I'm just not good at. But I'm I, I'm also very resourceful in trying to turn those things that are like, very obvious shortcomings into something that seems exciting. So I don't know. Well, I mean, that, that was part of the thing though, is because I was able to sort of understand that like, Nick has the sort of experience and sort of resources at his disposal that if he wanted to paint from a monitor, he could make it. So he's painting from, from a monitor. Like it's a choice that he is specifically making to paint from his phone. Um, so there's got to be something there. There's got to be sort of like a, a way that you engage with painting from your phone um, that's different from painting from a screen. And immediately as I started it, I was like, yes, this is different. I can see. Yeah, what I, I, I don't zoom in on it. Like, I'm not going to say at all, but I'm, I almost, ne I, mean, I go through paintings that, you know, people would say, oh, that's where you zoomed into the face or something. I yeah. don't, you know, if I tap on my phone, it's usually cause it's, it's, it uh, goes off like, and I have yeah. to tap it to like turn it back on, but I don't usually zoom in on stuff cause I don't like it. I, I even, I'm, I've become so like used to just doing this that my brain sometimes with my painting wants to do this. And it's like so stupid that I have to like, I have to tell myself, no, come on, that's good enough. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I painted my whole life with small photos. Like that's good enough. It's it don't, yeah. you don't you don't have to. And the thing is, like, when I realize that I when I'm zooming in on stuff, I realize that I start, you know, losing my, my the, the sense of wholeness in a painting. I mean, that that's just a almost like a surefire way of of prematurely going into detail and and just losing all context for your painting. So. I, I'm I'm always like super basic in that and it's like nope nope go back to the idea of the whole go back to the idea of the whole like that's you know it's something that my teacher certainly said you know and and you were asking you know maybe you can finish with that first thing you asked me or maybe if you have something else but um we can get to that no, no, no. but um but um I think that the the concept of wholeness of unity is probably the one that attracted me the most of you know, yeah. that when, when, when I started to hear how my teachers explained the painting to me, that one idea was just, I don't know, it just clicked in my brain. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it for, you know, for two years, I couldn't do like a half decent painting, but that notion of unity in light, unity in shadow of trying to like almost in your mind's eye to step back and, and sense what, you know, the concept of wholeness in is in a, in an inhabited room or, you know, it, you know, if you're painting outside in just like a, this dark street, this dark little 
like or hallway or whatever it is that you're painting it doesn't matter or like you know the 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 unity in 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 a bunch of grapes um uh i've always adored that that's probably why i you know hopefully i i i was able to to um communicate how like how much i thought uh rob poynton's paintings were just remarkable cuz yeah it, it's just it is that idea of bigness of wholeness of essence of unity that um that i was always you know that i feel that almost every great painter speaks about um i saw it manifested like beautifully in his work i was like yeah that's it that's that's exactly what my teachers were referring to that's exactly what people when they speak about um velasquez or they speak about sargent that that's what they're talking about like that's it's right there so i think that's the one that grabbed me the most and i think that that's yeah. why i'm probably a painter that favors um expression over like being faithful to nature or um um atmosphere um instead of detail um just you know they they seem to be like the bigger sort of broad strokes of nature i i like those yeah. i i really really like those I think there's other people far better suited than me to to do the the smaller bits of nature. Um but I I like the bigger parts. So Yes, definitely, definitely. Um but well, thank no, you very much. No, sure. Are uh, we good? Do you want to did you, did you want to ask something else or talk about something no, else? I, I, to... I'm sort of, I'm going to save all my questions for the next time we do this, obviously. Of course, do. Um, of course. Um because this has been an absolute pleasure. Um Yeah. I have to say uh, uh if people were oh that's nice because i see a bot the, i turned around to see a uh, chat and all i saw was a bot so right, okay. best adults uh, maybe it's a comment from something you said tommy best adult <laughs> dating site so maybe there's uh, something something in there maybe that maybe yeah. they're suggesting i'm so sorry but it. if you're seeing me i have to look over my shoulders to look at the screen to look at the monitor to see chat and i was it's good it was impossible but uh, but no, but that Danny's like super super busy, so um, she helped me out with the beginning, and now I'm gonna have to struggle to put like to to try to click and stream. But um, <laughs> but no, thank you, dude. That's awesome, awesome painting together. That's super super cool. So and talking while painting, which I probably enjoy more than than just painting. Yes, together, so I I love talking. I I do really <laughs> talking. No, um, dude, that's awesome. I think next year, next year, if everything goes to plan, which is, you know, I don't know in this world, if you can say those things, but, yeah. um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be up there. So, um, so, uh, hopefully we can, we can finally meet and I can meet a lot of the, uh, cool people of, uh, you know, Island, uh, UK Island, Ken Kenyo that can, um, well, I know that my school would be very very happy to have you as a do a workshop or something oh so cool there's that yeah possibility. no awesome um, awesome so thank you so much dude thank you no, thank you thank you it's been honestly it's been my pleasure so no. thank you very much watch me uh weirdly like i'm gonna try to do this gracefully but i can't i don't know if i could pull it off uh just grab my mouse <laughs> stretch and i think i'm good here but uh, thank you, everyone. Sorry if I could, yeah. Sorry if I couldn't keep keep a tab on 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 chat. But I've always said this: like, I do this, like I do this with maybe far more superficial things because I do this with like people that talk about video games and you know maybe or it's either video games or just people talking about the Premier League. Uh, <laughs> but I'll put it on and I'll just feel like I have company while I paint. I just like it. Yep. I just like kind of feeling like okay i'm listening in in this conversation it's kind of cool and i do that with those two you know things it's either like football for me or like video games and um but i hope people can you know find that this is cool you just you know you just turn it on as if it was like a radio and you just turn it on there's people talking and you can you know you guys can paint and we can paint and that's it so anyways uh but we'll see you i don't i don't know if um We'll be able to see you guys tomorrow. I don't think so. Uh, we'll try to do... I'll, I'll try to be conscious of showing you guys how 
uh, shipping is going, you know, and maybe we could do like a little live Instagram or something so that we can show people how, you know, when we get our books in, like, um, um, uh, and then when we're packing stuff and then when we're going to the uh, post office, uh, hopefully that sounds like three simple things, but, um, <laughs> but they are not simple at all. Uh, I I'm, I'm hoping like I'm right now, I'm just blindly hoping that it's like super easy that you just go to a customs lawyer and you give them like your paperwork and then they tell you, okay, here's your shipment. Uh, this is how much money you have to pay to uh, import the uh, books and you pay it. And then you go to the, um, our books are now at the, um, at the, uh, Houston airport. So we have to go to this, I guess, to, you know, these specific warehouses and you just show up with your paperwork and then you put it up, put it in your truck. We have to rent a truck and then we take it to my brother's home and then we start, um, unpacking and then packing everything. And hopefully we can print out everything through stamps.com, which would make it a thousand million times easier. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds great, but the last time I did this with my brother, it was not in Houston. I did it in San Diego. Oh, I can't tell you all the things that went wrong with that like, <laughs> tiny little equation. It's like everything, everything was weird and wrong. And we had to like, just, I don't know, like fix it on like while we were doing it. And it was awesome. So new new little bit of adventure and hopefully it'll be cool but yeah we'll keep people posted um as we're doing that i mean it gives me a chance to visit my brother whom i love and i get to see only like once a year which is sad uh but um but hopefully we'll be able to do this like super well and the cool thing is is that the other times i've done it i mean my brother's been there but uh, i've done it by myself uh, but now it's with danny which is like she's a powerhouse so she she makes everything easier so um, so I think the two of us are far stronger and far, so it, we, we think a lot better than I can think by myself. So, um, yeah. So Tommy, thank you. You were awesome, dude. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Gorgeous conversation. And best of luck. Yeah. As well. Congrats it's again good. on your, um, is there a way that you say portrait artist of the year? Do you say pouty, pouty? No, do you? I, no, I just say portrait, portrait artist of the year. I'm going to say um, pouty. So, um, <laughs> no, congrats on that. And um, I'm sure you're going to be there for, for third, fourth, fifth time. Uh, but Hopefully. I'm sure you're always going to kick ass, dude. You always kick ass. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very That's much. It. Sure. Um, I'll see you later, Tommy. Talk to you later. Cool. And thanks, see you later. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Okay.